The lecture honours the memory of our dear colleague, John Cusack, whose life was tragically cut short by cancer in 2002 to our great loss. While the number of us uh, who were lucky enough to work with John during his 20-year career at the bank is shrinking, those of us who did remember him as the best of colleagues. He always had time to listen, read our work, and provide thoughtful advice, not by email, but in person. John also had a great sense of what is important and what isn't, and that's a valuable trait in an economist. His practical approach and commitment to answering the most important macro policy questions are shared by our keynote speaker, David Romer, the Herman Royer Professor in Political Economy at the University of California, Berkeley. I have known David and his wife, research partner and equally eminent economist, Christina Romer, since our doctoral studies together at MIT, and I won't tell you how long ago that was. And I'm delighted to, to welcome him to the Bank of Canada. We are most fortunate and grateful to, to have him with us today, especially given the long trip uh, from California. Over his distinguished career, David has made uh, important contributions to research on topics at the core of macroeconomics, prices, growth, and monetary and fiscal policy. His outstanding research has been widely published and recognizes, recognized with him taking on senior roles at the American Economics Association and the National Bureau of Economic Research, as well as an appointment as a fellow of the Acad American Ac uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences. David is not only known for his pathbreaking research, but has also read, received accolades for his exemplary teaching and advising. Indeed, many of us have benefited from his widely used text, graduate textbook in macroeconomics. His topic today speaks directly to a key theme of the 2021 review and renewal of the bank's monetary policy framework. Can we do better than flexible inflation targeting? David has kindly agreed to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes to leave time for questions at the end. David, the floor is yours. Oh, well, that was, thank you, that was very nice, Larry. Um, so I'm delighted to be here uh, giving the Cusack Memorial uh, Lecture. Uh, some of you may know that the originally scheduled speaker was a, a Romer, uh, Christina Romer, who Larry referred to. Um, it turns out she had to have rotator cuff surgery uh, earlier in the fall, and uh, it turns out that if you're a right-handed academic, being without the use of your right arm for a couple of months is a pretty big problem. Uh, so she had to cancel, and when she did, she mentioned that she knew of at least one person who might be available. <laughs> and uh, I was really thrilled when the organizer uh, took her up on that possibility. So here I am. Um, all right, so. Um, okay, so the first thing to say is it's just, it's wonderful that the Bank of Canada has this process. It is very unlikely that we figured out the right monetary policy framework once and for all. We are always learning more about the world and the world is always changing. So it makes sense to, theory, to, to rethink periodically whether the monetary policy framework should be changed or potentially even uh, fundamentally overhauled. And so it's a great credit that the Bank of Canada has institutionalized this process and that it takes it uh, so seriously. The central idea that I'm going to try to build my talk around is that it, it takes a framework to build a framework. And I'm going to argue that that's both obvious but also fundamental. The sense in which it's obvious is you can't replace something with nothing. You have to replace something with something. And so if you're going to replace one framework, you have to have uh, another one. The sense in which it's fundamental is that to think about whether the Bank of Canada should move away from flexible inflation targeting, it's not enough to discuss how well flexible inflation targeting has worked. Uh, you have to ask whether there's a well-specified alternative that we would expect uh, to work better. That said, in my talk, I'm not going to focus on just one single alternative uh, to flexible inflation targeting. Uh, one, one 
possible alternative. So we aren't far along enough as a profession for me to be able to point to one specific alternative as the only way to go. And it doesn't make sense at this early stage of what the Bank of Canada is doing to try to focus the discussion uh, that narrowly. So instead, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to do three things. First, I'm going to make the case that the world has changed in ways that make this a particularly important time to think about possible alternatives to flexible inflation targeting. Second, and the thing that I'll spend the most time on, is I'll discuss what I see as the main uh, alternatives to the, to the current framework. And then at the end, I'll briefly describe some evidence about one particular uh, alternative. OK, so let me turn to the first part. And that is a thesis statement, as we say in high school English class. Uh, and the thesis statement for this part is the case for flexible inflation targeting uh, is no longer clear cut. All right, so start with background. Uh, what's the role of monetary policy? It's to manage uh, aggregate demand, uh, so to produce low and stable inflation to offset shocks to the economy. As of, say, a dozen years ago, flexible inflation targeting had done those things very successfully in a wide range of countries, and it had done so for you know, 10 to 20, 20 years. So this is a familiar picture. This is the great moderation for concreteness. It's for the US. And it's for the 15 years from 1992 to 2006. So if you look on the left at inflation, uh, it came down uh, from a pretty low level to start with to uh, the Fed's then implicit 2% uh, target. And it was very stable around that level thereafter. If you look on the right at unemployment, or you think more broadly about the real economy, uh, unemployment came down to the natural rate. And I've drawn in a line at 5% at as a rough guide, and then had quite small fluctuations uh, around that. The US went through a 15-year period in which it had only one recession, and that was quite small. You could show pictures like this for lots of other, other countries. So as of the end of the period shown in these graphs, it was hard to see much room for improvement over flexible uh, inflation targeting. That changed. So uh, changed in the Great Recession and also with what happened after the Great Recession. So in the recession itself, monetary policy did not succeed in offsetting shocks to aggregate demand. And then following the recession, we had a very long period when aggregate demand was too low. So here's another familiar picture. This is the 10 years after the ones that I just showed you. So and again, it's the US for concreteness. So start with the recession itself. Start with unemployment. Uh, unemployment skyrocketed. And then in the recession itself, inflation actually fell, uh, fell sharply. So we didn't achieve what we wanted in terms of a crucial thing that we try to use monetary policy for. There was a sudden sharp fall in aggregate demand, and policy was not, did not succeed uh, in counteracting that and offsetting that. But then after the recession, we had more problems. We had close to a decade where inflation was generally below target, and unemployment was uh, persistently uh, far above the natural rate. So again, we didn't get what we wanted in the aggregate demand role of monetary policy. Aggregate demand was persistently lower than what was desirable from the point of view of policymakers' own objectives for inflation and for real outcomes. And again, this is the US. I could walk you through pictures like this for pretty much any other major economy uh, in the world. Now, a key aspect of that was the, of this weakness of aggregate demand was that monetary policy makers were constrained in their ability to lower their target interest rates. So here I've gone more broadly than the US. These are the target interest rates of five major central banks. And in every case, the rate was at or very close to what policymakers viewed as the lowest possible level for a very long time. And you know, there's this now this sort of semantic controversy. Do we say effective lower bound, zero lower bound? I, I'm just going to say lower bound. That seems like the, the easy solution to that problem. OK. I don't think that there's any doubt that the lower bound was critical to the weak aggregate demand that we had. If policymakers could have lowered rates further, they would have and evaluated in terms of their own objectives, aggregate demand, and economic outcomes uh, would have been better. 
So that's the past. Are these issues still relevant? And I think the answer is very much yes. Uh, so the lower bound on interest rates is likely to continue to be important. So there's now a consensus that low inflation is beneficial. So inflation is almost certain to remain relatively low. The normal equilibrium real rate has come down. The, most of the evidence suggests that it's going to remain relatively low, even if it comes back somewhat. So you put those two things together, that says that normal nominal interest rates are likely to be quite low going forward. And economies are still going to be subject to shocks. Uh, and we now know that very large shocks are possible. So I think we have to continue to worry about uh, the lower bound. Another thing that I think is very important going forward is that the burden of managing aggregate demand is likely to fall even more heavily on monetary policy than it did in the Great Recession and its aftermath. So most countries, and I should say this is not true of Canada, but most countries have quite a bit less fiscal space than they did when the recession hit. And countries use fiscal policy less when they have less fiscal space. And despite the large amount of evidence from recent work that discretionary countercyclical fiscal policy is effective, it has less political support than it did uh, a decade ago. So my view is that if we're hit with another shock on the scale of what triggered the Great Recession anytime soon, we won't see the sort of large, coordinated, cross-country fiscal response that we had last time. So more is going to fall on the plate uh, of policymakers. So, uh, wrapping up this as a little high school essay portion of the talk, uh, it's for these reasons that I say that the case for flexible inflation targeting is no longer clear cut. So the central role of monetary policy is to manage aggregate demand. We've just been through a decade where we would have preferred quite different outcomes for aggregate demand, and we may face other episodes where similar forces are at work looking, looking ahead. The other thing I want to say here is that I think it would be a mistake for Canadian policymakers to, kind of to go to the, oh, it can't happen here uh, trap. So why is that tempting? Well, the Great Recession was less severe in Canada than in most countries. The Bank of Canada was constrained by the lower bound on interest rates for a shorter period than other major central banks. And the Canadian financial system is famously stable. So all that makes it tempting to think that the possibility of an episode like what happened over the past decade is something for policymakers you know, in, in other countries to worry about. And I feel strongly that that's the wrong message for Canadian policymakers to take from the past decade. I think um, the fact that the last big shock took a form that made it less severe for Canada doesn't mean that the next one will. Big shocks can come in lots of forms, including ones that we don't uh, expect. So I think the right message is to take is that very large shocks are possible. And I think it would just be wishful thinking to think that Canada might be immune uh, from them. All right. As I said at the outset, uh, just saying that flexible inflation targeting hasn't delivered outcomes that we're completely happy with in recent years and that similar issues may arise in the future isn't enough to establish that we should change the existing framework. It takes a framework uh, to, to, beat a, to beat a framework. So in other words, we need to assess whether there's something that would be likely to deliver better performance. So what I want to do now is try to give an organized guide to alternative frameworks. So it's a, a taxonomy of monetary policy frameworks, if you like. As I go, I'll make some comments about some potential strengths and weaknesses of the various possibilities. But I'm going to try not to go beyond that. And I'm definitely going to stop short of giving any kind of bottom line uh, recommendation. All right. So in this taxonomy, I think the most important kind of way to divide things up, the biggest branch is to the, the framework is, is into frameworks that differ from the current flexible inflation targeting approach with a 2% target at all times and ones that only depart from that uh, when the economy is at, is at the lower bound. So I'm going to start with ones that depart from the existing framework at all times. And here are four possibilities uh, in that category. So one is just to have a higher inflation target. Uh, the middle two are things that involve targeting a path rather than targeting an inflation rate. So targeting a path for the price level or a path for nominal GDP. And then I've grouped together at the bottom things I call exotic possibilities 
And these are ways of trying to basically eliminate uh, the lower bound on interest rates. So abolishing or taxing currency or having a potentially varying exchange rate between currency and the unit and the unit of account. Let me make a couple general comments about these and then I'll also make some specific ones. So general comments. Uh, number one is uh, an important advantage of all of these alternatives is that they would provide a single overall approach for monetary policy at all times. That is, while policymakers uh, would, of course, use different tools when they were constrained by the lower bound, there'd be no change in terms of the overarching framework that was guiding the use of whatever tools policymakers were using at any time. So that would make monetary policy simpler to understand and more transparent, and that could mean it would have be more effective in terms of managing expectations. So in many ways, a unified framework uh, is a plus, but it also comes with a minus. The central bank would no longer be using the current flexible inflation targeting approach in normal times. But as I've described, and as we all know, that approach has worked quite well in normal times. So there's a potential cost to saying, well, we're going to stop using it even in the times when it's worked well. So an important issue is, are those costs real? And if so, how large uh, are they? And I'm going to come back to that in the last part of my talk when I present some evidence about one uh, specific uh, alternative. OK. So those are general comments about these alternatives. Uh, now let me make just sort of a, a set of specific comments. So the first is, uh, I think the exotic regimes are just a complete non-starter. So things like abolishing currency or taxing currency. These are great for academic research, but I just they do not deserve serious consideration by policymakers. To, to me, they have the feel of Policymakers who think that they're really smart and they know better than ordinary folks impose, imposing some kind of weird, complicated, heavy-handed change to the usual ways of doing things for people's own benefits. And I think that's just not a direction that policymakers should think uh, of going. Second comment is I think raising the inflation target is also a non-starter with that, at least for now, caveat. So central banks have invested a lot in low inflation targets. And changing the target, even by a little, would therefore have substantial costs at this point. And if you're actually going to relax the lower bound, you wouldn't need, you'd need more than a small change in the target. You'd need a substantial change. So I think that this should, should be in the category of last resorts or you know, near last resorts, not sort of the first thing that we do uh, in response to what we've learned over the last uh, decade. All right, comment three is about both of those path-based alternative frameworks, which is they have the advantage of being uh, self-correcting. So if something pushes the economy off track, they're actually in those regimes, there are actually two kinds of forces that would be working to push the economy back on track. So the most obvious for forces are expectational. So we know an important part of how monetary policy affects the economy is through expectations of sophisticated people in financial markets, maybe of firms and households as well. Um, an example of that is that uh, there, the fact that there are now strong expectations that the central bank will return inflation to its target if it departs seems to be quite important in preventing one-time shocks to the price level from turning into persistent changes in the inflation rate that then require a painful uh, adjustment process to undo. Another example of the importance of expectations is that we know when monetary policy is constrained by the lower bound on its usual policy rate, effects operating through expectations are particularly important to any ability the central bank has to influence the economy. And a potentially important feature of, path, of, a, of either of these path-baked frameworks is that they could have significant expectational benefits. So think about a price level path, for example. If a recession pushes inflation below target, that should automatically generate expected inflation, which by itself should stimulate the economy and help inflation recover. But the expectational forces aren't the only ones at work. There's actually a second set of forces, which is my view of these regimes is that the path isn't supposed to be a substitute for monetary policy actions. It's supposed to be a complement to them. So take the example of the price level uh, going below, below the path. Under a path level path regime, the central bank's not meeting its target. It should feel impelled to take actions to bring the price level back to the path. 
those actions are obviously also going to help the economy recover and so make the economy uh, stable. Final specific point. Uh, is specifically about the price level, which is the price level can be a poor guide to policy. So the price level sometimes gets pushed around uh, by things that don't seem highly relevant uh, to desirable uh, aggregate demand policy. And to illustrate this, I want to think about what would have happened if monetary policymakers in the US and in the UK had adopted a price level path regime with a 2% slope uh, at the start of 2006. That was a pretty calm period economically. So the US, for example, the Fed had largely finished raising interest rates. House prices had leveled off. They were coming down a little bit. Uh, inflation was close to target. GDP was kind of growing uh, at trend. So kind of would, been, would have been as good a time as any uh, to start a policy of targeting the price level. So with that regime, what you do, you'd set a, a base at the beginning of 2006 and then draw a target path with a slope of 2% per year. And I've taken it up through September of 2008, uh, kind of up to the point where the, the world fell apart. And then I've added the actual paths of the price level in the US and the UK. And what you see is that they were drifting above the target path uh, noticeably in the U.S. and then even more so in, in the U.K. So what that means is that if monetary policymakers in these two countries had been looking at a price level path with the 2006 start date, they would have been getting signals that policy should be substantially tighter over this period than what they are actually doing. Given what we know about the history of this period, this seems like a pretty substantial black mark for the idea that a price level path is a reliable guide to good monetary policy. All right, so that was one branch. The other branch is alternative frameworks that depart from the current flexible inflation targeting regime only uh, at the lower bound. So, uh, and the, the first thing to say about that is that as we all know, central banks have a wide array of tools that they can use when the short-term policy interest rate is close to zero. So here's my list. Uh, I think they're well known, so I'm not going to comment uh, on most of them. I want to say a word about the last one, which is not usually uh, on these lists. So there's good evidence that monetary policymakers' words can affect exchange rates. And well, there's a social contract among central bankers that they are not allowed to say that they want their exchange rate to depreciate. They are allowed to acknowledge that exchange rate depreciation is part of the usual transmission mechanism for expansionary monetary policy. So putting those two things together, if there's a situation where a central bank finds itself at the lower bound, and I should say if it's not a, a worldwide aggregate demand uh, shortfall, um, one thing policymakers might want to do to help their economy is, well, of course, without ever saying that they would like the exchange rate to depreciate, to just be somewhat more clear and visible in their, than usual in their statements that a temporary period of a weaker exchange rate is part of the transmission mechanism for monetary policy. So I think that's another, another tool, and it's one that doesn't get discussed as much uh, as it should. But the key thing I want to say here is that it's crucial that we not take too much comfort in this long list of tools. In the Great Recession and its aftermath, monetary policymakers operating under their flexible inflation frameworks use many of these tools quite aggressively. But as I showed you at the beginning, we nonetheless had persistent large shortfalls of aggregate demand from the levels that almost everyone agrees were desirable. So what I take from this is that having the tools and being willing to use them isn't a guarantee of success. So I think a critical question in thinking about whether the current framework for monetary policy should be changed is whether there are alternative frameworks or guiding principles for how to use the tools that would make it more likely that they would get us uh, to where we want uh, to be. So I want to talk about what I see as the, the main possibilities for kind of guiding frameworks for what you do once you hit the lower bound. I'm going to start with things that are pretty close to flexible inflation targeting and then move to some things uh, that are further, further away. OK, so the first possibility is to uh, embed the use of the tools in a forecast targeting framework. 
So in general, forecast targeting means you continually adjust the tools of monetary policy. So normally that would mean the short-term policy rate so that the outlook for inflation and output, the forecast, stays on track with the central bank's objectives uh, as well as possible. So in the context of monetary policy at the lower bound, what forecast targeting would mean, it would be spelling out a target timetable and path for getting aggregate demand back to desired levels and then adjusting the various tools the central bank is using at the lower bound, up or down, as needed to stay on track for that desired uh, timetable. So on the one hand, that's not a dramatic departure from flexible inflation targeting. Monetary policy is still guided by a desire to keep the real economy stable and inflation close to target. And on the other hand, it's a much stronger framework than how unconventional tools were generally used over the past decade. So if you look at central, major central banks' own forecasts over the past decade, it's clear that while they were often using their unconventional tools a lot, they were using them up only up to a point where the outlook for aggregate demand was still well short of where they would have liked it to be. And they also, their use of the tools also often involved taking kind of a wait and see attitude where they would, where they just do nothing for extended periods between policy changes rather than regularly adjusting policy to keep the outlook on track. And neither of those things is what you would do in a forecast targeting framework. So there, I think there is a genuine uh, difference. The second kind of moderate departure uh, is really just a stronger version of the first. So I think we all know what the three most important words said by a central banker uh, over the past decade have been. Um, there they are. Uh, if that were said in the context uh, not of protecting the euro, but in the context of monetary policy at the lower bound, it would be a strong public commitment to use the available tools as much as necessary to get to the desired level of aggregate demand. Again, that would work both through, could work both through expectations. It, it would be a powerful statement. It could directly affect expectations. And it would also work through essentially forcing policymakers' hands. It would provide strong guidance to policymakers about how aggressively or moderately to use their tools because there'd be this commitment to get to a certain place. All right, bigger departures from flexible inflation targeting at the lower bound. Um, I think the, they have a key thing in common, which is a temporary overshooting of the usual uh, inflation target. And that could take uh, various forms. So the most obvious uh, is just the way you temporarily depart, uh, temporarily overshoot the target is you say, for a while we have a higher inflation target. The alternatives are to use one of the path rules that I described below. You be adopting the rule, the path in a situation where the economy was weak, so it's likely that inflation would be below uh, the target, the target, or the growth rate of nominal GDP would be below normal. And so, to get back uh, on your path, you'd need a period uh, of overshooting. So again, could work through expectations, and uh, would give policymakers a reason. Uh, to step up their action. So you'd be generating expectations of higher inflation, higher real growth, and again, adopting a framework where policymakers would be essentially committed to taking strong steps. You could easily couple any of these things with either forecast targeting or even uh, with whatever, uh, whatever it takes. Um, OK, so I'm still in this category of, of, of frameworks that are flexible inflation targeting in normal times but do something uh, different uh, when you're at the lower bound. That means that you'd be, there'd be times when the central bank would sometimes essentially announce a switch in how they were conducting policy. Oh, this is a special time. We need to break out uh, the whatever we do at the lower bound. Oh, things are back to normal. We can go back to the usual thing. And that would, uh, could have effects on, on expectations. An announcement like that would get lots of attention from, from lots of people, maybe not the general public, but lots of people who are important to the economy. And so there could be important effects on expectations. They could be positive, And the clearest example here is Franklin Roosevelt taking the US off the gold standard a month after taking office. 
the evidence of how fast the U.S. economy turned around, not just financial markets, stock prices, expectations, but real activity, it's extraordinary. I mean, just imagine you know, industrial production going from falling at double-digit rates to rising at double-digit annual rates, you know, essentially turning uh, on a dime. But there's a dot, 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 or the, expect the effects could be, could be negative. Oh, my God, why are they doing this? Things must be really bad. Um, and a possible concrete example there, there's some evidence that some announcements by central banks of stimulative policy actions during the crisis actually had adverse effects on expectations because the main reaction was not relief at what the central bank was doing, but concern about what was prompting it to take those steps. So if you're going to have one of these regime switching frameworks for policy, it would be really important to think about how to manage expectational issues about switching from business as usual to a different approach at the lower bound. And I want to say two things about that. The first is just, I think, how to deal with those expectational issues. It's interesting. It's a potentially important area for research. We just don't know that much. But I don't have time to do that. So instead, what I'm going to do is just offer two conjectures of what we might find if we looked into these issues further. OK. So conjecture number one is that you should err on the side of switching, uh, switching soon rather than later. My intuition here is that if the central bank can build a reputation for acting early, then when people see it acting, people will view that as reassuring, not uh, as alarming. So in the context of Canada, an example of a possible trigger or rule for when to switch would be to do so as soon as the bank thought that if it stuck with a regular approach to policy, there was a non-negligible chance that it wouldn't be able to get inflation back to target over the usual six to eight quarters. So we're not quite sure the usual tools are enough, so right away we're going to switch just as, just as insurance. Conjecture two is err on the side of doing too much. So this is the, the Colin Powell doctrine as applied to monetary policy. Uh, my intuition here is that if the central bank can build a reputation for using its unconventional tools with overwhelming force to achieve its objectives, then again, when it switches out of business as usual, people that will increase confidence that things will turn out well. And it would also mean that most likely, after this kind of the initial actions, the first adjustment the policymakers could make uh, would be the, to dial back their actions rather than having to step them up. And that would also seem reassuring, I would think, would be reassuring to people. But again, we don't have formal models. We don't have evidence that we know of about these things. So these, what these are, as, as, as they're labeled, is just as conjectures. All right. Last thing I want to do in this part of my talk is to discuss Abenomics and what the Bank of Japan has done over the last several years in light of the, the discussion uh, that I've been, been giving you. And the reason I think this case is important to look at is that the Bank of Japan has probably made a sharper break from their previous approach to policy than any other major central bank in recent years. If we want to get evidence about how does changing policy and your approach to policy matter, it's the best place to look uh, right now. So what Japanese policymakers have done since 2013 is just extraordinary. So they started with a hugely publicized change in policy. So raising their inflation target to 2%, doubling the monetary base, and doing QE on a scale that was considerably larger relative to their economy than what the US uh, had done. And then since then, they've done at least four major rounds of expansions and modifications of that, that initial program. At the same time, they haven't put their actions into a strong overall framework for what's guiding the, the policy, so for, for how and when they'll achieve their objectives. There's no forecast targeting. There's certainly no whatever it takes. And there's been a, a tiny bit of a plan into uh, sort of to temporarily overshoot the inflation target, but, but nothing very specific or very strong on that dimension. All right, so what do we learn? I think we learned two main things. The most obvious thing we learn is that it's very hard to get aggregate demand up using unconventional tools, at least within the framework that the Bank of Japan has been using. So despite all that the bank has done, they have not succeeded in getting inflation up to 2%. It's still well below. 
So I think that's strong evidence for my earlier point that we shouldn't be sanguine about the fact we have lots of unconventional tools at our disposal. Having a wide array of tools and being willing to use them on a vast, vast scale doesn't guarantee you'll succeed in getting aggregate demand up to the levels that you want. Now, there's a first order question here that the Bank of Japan's experience doesn't answer that we'd really like to know the answer to is, well, what would have happened if they had put this in the context of some other framework? What if they had said, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to get inflation to 2% within two years. At each meeting, if it looks like we're going to fall short, we're going to crank up what we're going to do. So we're, we're continually on track, so forecast targeting. Or if they'd said, if we're not at 2% in two years, we're going to switch to a price level target. So any shortfall after that point, we're going to have to make up. What would those things have done? We don't know, because they didn't do either of those things. OK, so that was lesson one. Lesson two is that it, although getting the desired aggregate demand is hard, trying to do so uh, has, has benefits, and they can be pretty substantial. So less importantly, on the inflation front, inflation is still well below 2%, but it at least moved from being slightly negative to slightly positive. So that's a good thing. But I think the bigger message is on the real side. So in terms of real outcomes, Japan has done very, very well. If you're going to talk about real outcomes in Japan, you have to adjust for demographics because their labor force and population are shrinking. Uh, so I've done that here. So this, since the start of Abenomics, real GDP per person of working age has grown at an average annual rate of 2.5%. That is way, way better than Japan was doing in the uh, two decades before. And it's actually noticeably better than the US uh, has done over that same, same period. So it seemed on the terms of real, so all these efforts, they haven't done as much as the Bank of Japan wanted, but they seem to have had substantial uh, benefits. All right, last part of the talk. Uh, I want to present evidence about some of these issues in the context of one specific alternative. I think that I hope this is of some interest in its own right, and I also hope it's illustrative of the kinds of issues that come up if you start to think about any particular alternative. This is based on ongoing work with Christina Romer, and the specific alternative we're looking at is a target path for nominal GDP. So far, at least, we're focusing on the US. It's a country we know well, and the data we need are available. I was delighted to hear that there soon there'll be forecast data for the Bank of Canada, so maybe our sample size will, will get bigger uh, soon. Um, OK, so just to remind you what's involved. Uh, so the central bank sets a desired growth rate of nominal GDP, and they start starting from some base period. The desired growth rate implies a target path uh, of nominal uh, GDP. And then the central bank adjusts policy to try to keep nominal GDP close to the target uh, path. And as I've discussed before, in the context of path-based policies, uh, you're required to respond to past misses. Uh, and so that could have desirable effects on expectations. It could also spur policymakers to, to take actions that, that keep the economy uh, stable. All right, so what do we actually do? Uh, let me start by telling you what we don't do. I've sort of made a big deal about the expectational effects of path-based systems could be very important. We're beating our heads against the wall trying to get evidence to figure out how to get evidence about that. We haven't observed any such regimes. We're not sure how to do that. So we're doing something that is more limited. Um, so we, th we think through or we simulate implementing a target path for nominal GDP starting at various dates, given the real-time data and forecasts from, from that period. And doing that kind of lets us do two things. First, it forces us to think about the practical issues involved. When you say targeting path, what, it, what would that actually mean uh, in practice? And then the other is we look at what, such, what the rules would have told policymakers uh, to do. So one way to think about what we're doing relates to a point that I made earlier. Right? Flexible inflation targeting has worked quite well away from the lower bound. So if you adopt a different framework at all times, which a, a nominal GDP path would be doing, it might have costs if it caused policymakers to depart substantially from what they would have done under flexible inflation targeting in periods when they weren't constrained uh, by the lower bound. So think of this as not being about the benefit side of nominal GDP targeting, which is the expect 
expectations, but about the, the cost uh, side. So, and within the cost side, we're kind of looking at two questions. How do you specify the practicalities of the rule uh, to make the cost as small as possible? And once you've done that, how big are, are the costs that, that you get? All right, in terms of what we find, let me start with practical uh, issues. I think my summary here is that the practical issues are quite important, more complicated than we thought, but probably manageable. And we've identified um, three significant practical issues that would need to be uh, addressed. So first um, is about data revision. So if you talk to a monetary policymaker about targeting nominal GDP, invariably the first thing they mention are data revisions. The nominal GDP data are not set in stone, they're revised. So in terms of the month-to-month -month revisions, you know, the initial announcement and the first revision and the second revision, our finding is that those just are too small to matter noticeably. You can, you can deal with them however you want. It's not going to matter. But the larger annual and benchmark revisions that the US goes through, those are quantitatively important. And the result is that if you didn't adjust the target path in response to them, you'd have to make noticeable changes in policy for reasons unrelated to the outlook for the things you actually care about. You'd essentially be chasing revisions to data, you know, potentially years uh, in the past. So one would almost certainly want to have as part of the rule that the target path is adjusted automatically for revisions to things that happened uh, in, in you know, more than, than the very recent past. Um, second practical issue concerns the role uh, of forecasts. It would be great if you could have a rule that was based only on hard data you know, from the statistical agency on nominal GDP as it came in. And our finding is that that's simply not realistic. A rule that's based uh, only on actual data, not forecasts, would often have caused policy to be many months behind what the Fed actually did in responding to major economic developments. So forecasts respond quickly, actual data uh, does not. And the third and the biggest practical issue is how to respond to changes in estimates of potential growth. And we find that not responding to those could have very large effects. So a basic fact about those changes is that they're, they're very large. So over the 20 years from 1992 to 2011, the Fed staff estimates of the growth rate of potential output varied from a low of 2.0% to a high uh, of 4.2%. So if the Fed had just chosen a growth rate of nominal GDP and stuck with it, there would have been large changes in what inflation rate it was implicitly aiming for. So if, you know, suppose they'd adopted the nominal GDP rule at a time when they thought the growth rate of potential was 2%, so they'd chosen 4% growth of nominal GDP to try to keep inflation close to 2 If potential growth then rose to 4 and they didn't revise the target growth rate, the rule would force them to aim for zero inflation. So that's a pretty big, pretty big swing. There's a view that's out there that that's a, not a desirable feature of nominal GDP targeting, to have sort of the implicit inflation target automatically adjust. And I'm just going to say we're really skeptical of that, and I'd be happy to say more about that, about why uh, afterwards. But if the central bank wants to avoid those swings in inflation, what it's going to have to do is revisit the slope of the nominal GDP path periodically. And because estimates of potential growth are often changed substantially in a short period, our evidence suggests that it would need to do that pretty frequently, like every couple of years uh, at least. So we think that's doable, but it's something that would be important if a nominal GDP rule were actually uh, adopted. OK, so those practicalities. So then the next step is some evidence about how a rule might perform uh, in practice. So what we do is we consider the Fed adopting a practical nominal GDP target path as of various dates. And what I mean by practical is it accounts for these various, these various issues I've just been describing. And most importantly, changing the slope of the path periodically to try to keep inflation close to 2%. And then what we do is we compare the forecast path of nominal GDP with the path that the rule called for, and thus whether the rule called for tighter or looser policy. And notice that since the, what was actually happening to GDP and what people were forecasting for GDP, that was based on policy that was actually being done. Um, what we're doing is we're telling us whether the nominal GDP rule would have pushed policy to make, what would have pushed them to do relative to actual policy. Actual policy was basically flexible inflation targeting. So this is implicitly a comparison of nominal GDP targeting 
with the actual actions under flexible inflation targeting. And again, this is limited. It ignores effects on expectations, general equilibrium effects, the Lucas critique, on and on and on. It's a, it's a narrow thing. OK. So what I'm going to do is show you the results for a specific set of possible starting dates for a nominal GDP rule. So since the early 90s in the US, there have been kind of five major episodes of concerted monetary policy actions. So three episodes of tightening, two of loosening. And for each one, we asked, suppose the Fed had adopted a rule for the path of nominal GDP at the start of the episode. What would the nominal GDP rule have done, have told policymakers to do relative to what they actually uh, did? So here's a small font table. Let me try to walk you through it. Uh, in all five episodes, the nominal GDP rule would have called on the Fed to move policy in the direction that it did, but more so. So if you look down, what would the nominal GDP rule have told the Fed to do? The key thing is the word more appears uh, in every one of, of those entries. In addition, in every one of those episodes, in terms of getting inflation close to 2%, getting output close to potential, some additional move in the direction that the rule was calling for would probably have improved outcomes. So in other words, in all these episodes, the Fed actually didn't move as much as it would have to kind of get uh, to, to its, its objectives. So there's a really, there's a, a result here that we are quite surprised by, which is Right, moving from flexible inflation targeting, which has worked well away from the zero lower bound, replacing that with a rule that essentially forces policymakers to pursue something other than just looking at current output inflation. You'd expect that to impose costs relative to flexible inflation targeting in normal times. But our evidence says that well, it's not actually clear. You might actually get benefits even in normal times. It would have caused policymakers to make better choices in terms of their own objectives. So the potential costs of adopting that I've sort of been emphasizing about departing from flexible inflation targeting in normal times, it's not actually clear that they're there. OK, two caveats, three caveats. One, there may be further benefits from expectations. Second, in two of the episodes, the nominal GDP rule wouldn't just have called for moving policy in a helpful direction. It actually would have overshot. It would have called for going too far. So the Fed would have ended up on the other side of its objectives. So that definitely, that, that's clearly a downside. And second, and more important, this is all at an early stage. So for example, what I've shown you is based on just five candidate start dates for a nominal GDP rule. Um, we think they're really interesting ones, but we clearly have to consider the full universe. And we're in the process uh, of doing that. The, the broader point is this is a small amount of evidence about one possible alternative framework in one particular setting. It, the, the big message here is that any specific alternative, once you consider, it's going to raise lots of interesting issues and lead you in interesting directions. And that's certainly our view of what we're doing uh, here. So what we need, clearly, is much more research on a wide range of alternative frameworks. All right, so let me wrap up. Um, I have no idea if the Bank of Canada should change its framework. And I even, have even less idea than no idea whether, if it does change frameworks, targeting a path for nominal GDP is the best alternative. So what I hope I've done is to persuade you that the Bank of Canada should be thinking hard about alternative frameworks and doing careful research about the relevant issues. The current flexible inflation targeting regime solved the very real problems of high inflation and erratic monetary policy, and it solved them very well. But those aren't the only major problems we faced with regard to monetary policy recently and that we're likely to face uh, in coming years. The fact that the problems we face are different means that the framework that was appropriate for the earlier set of problems may not be the best one for the current problems. So I want to conclude just by saying that I want to applaud the Bank of Canada for having this process and that I look forward to learning more about the issues and possi possible alternative frameworks from the rest of the conference and from watching the bank's review process as it unfolds. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for the very clear presentation and, uh, and valuable insights. So we'll turn to questions and answers, please. Tim Lane, please. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting and uh, and and uh, 
sort of pulled together a whole lot of things. I think I, one thing of the things uh, one thing that struck me was the word more, um, and and the sense that I think throughout your presentation there's a sense that that policy actually could be more aggressive uh, in a lot of circumstances and that that would deliver better outcomes. Now I'm sort of contrasting that with a lot of the thinking that's been going on around. Um, policy under uncertainty, which sort of points to the opposite uh, idea that when there's a lot of uncertainty, you need to be cautious and, and so on. And sort of wondered um, uh, whether some of that, I mean, in, in a way, the, the caution part maybe plays a little bit more to our sensibilities as central bankers. But mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, sort of wondered uh, if, if that is a, a, a contrast that you would also draw, you know, whether in general, um, your sense is that we smooth too much, we we react too slowly and not aggressively enough in in, in both directions, and and whether that would be, you know, the, some more of the uh, I think you referred to the Colin Powell doctrine of overwhelming force. That whether that's a bit more of what's needed in some of these situations. Um, I think it's a great question, and I think if you look at the sort of the pre-inflation targeting world, you can see lots of story, lots of cases where people chased um, you know, small bits of data or, or uh, ideas that weren't right to, and pushed them too far and, and did too much. But over the past 25 years, it's, if, you're always, if it's always the case in retrospect, you look back and say, well, yes, there was uncertainty, but did we wish we'd gone further? If the answer is always yes, then that tells you you weren't doing enough. So the, that last, the table I put up, that was the direction of that findings, but I also said the last decade is, is very clear. If you had a time machine and you could go back to a meeting of the FOMC any time from you know, 2007 to 2012 and you got to nudge them in one direction, in retrospect, you would nudge them to, to, do, to do more. And so, um, and I think it's maybe particularly telling in that episode because it's not there was uncertainty, but it was also very clear which side of, of the objectives that, that we were on. So um, I do think, and looking at the Fed, I know, you know they've sort of gotten themselves into um, this position where every change in policy is a big deal, and the groundwork has to be laid for months, and so on. And the, the nimbleness of you know, even, you know, say, the, the Volcker Fed, where they you know, were happy to let interest rates move very quickly in short periods of time to pursue bigger picture objectives, that's been lost. And I think that, that's, that's evidence. And my own reading of things suggests that that's unfortunate. Good. Next question. David, please. Yeah, Dave, thank you. Um, I, was, um, I wish you had talked a little bit more uh, about the role of the lower bound, zero lower bound, or the effective lower bound. I mean, I guess implicitly when you, you drew up the performance of the U.S. economy, the idea was, well, we hit the lower bound and that's why inflation undershot and the economy uh, underperformed. So the effective lower bound seems to play a very critical role in the minds of a lot of theorists and I guess maybe even policymakers. Uh, I want to kind of challenge kind of that idea um, wait, do we really believe that? I mean, do we really believe as policymakers that if that lower bound wasn't there, that monetary policy could work seamlessly, that the worst effects of the Great Recession would have been mitigated? <clears throat> and if we um, and if we believe that, then why don't we work kind of instead of exploring alternative frameworks the way you did? <clears throat> excuse me. Why don't we explore more seriously? Uh, what we can do to kind of get get around that zero lower bound. I mean, do we really believe? And notice in a lot of these models, there's no cash. <laughs> you mentioned uh, something about cash. Do we really believe this lower bound is there because of cash? I mean, I don't think so. Uh, it's very costly to store, you know, hundred dollar bills. I, I just saw a, a, a documentary on Escobar during the height of the Colombian cartel. Uh, you know, they were they were burying like millions and millions of dollars and they were losing something like 10 percent per year. I mean, a negative nominal interest rate of 10 percent, they absorb very readily. Uh, so we, we we can't possibly, you know, and setting negative nominal interest rates on reserve balances is trivial. I mean, is it, it's not it's technologically feasible. So is the constraint legal if it's legal institutional? Why don't we work more towards fixing that? And then we can just apply flexible in, uh, inflation rate targeting and using aggressive negative nominal interest rates? I think those are both, those are, are two separate questions. I thought they were both great. Let me start with the second one. I think the, the lower bound is a real thing. And 
I think once nominal rates got more than trivially negative, it wouldn't be people taking cash out of the banks and putting in their mattresses. It would be the Vanguard cash fund. And the Vanguard cash fund would be you know, an armed uh, camp uh, with climate controlled things and where you would. They're not going to be holding cash, though. They would literally be holding cash. They'd be mm. literally be holding cash. Wow. Oh. That, 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 that's, that's, my, that's what I think would happen mm. if we tried to go too low. I mean, I could be wrong. So I, again, I'm speculating. I think these are great questions. The other one, yeah, I take it as, as I think it is, I mean, I, I hate to say something, you know, I, I, I think I, to, to my mind, it is clear that, that the lower bound was really important in practice. If, in, you know, if for whatever reason, in nominal rates had been at five in September 2008, I just have no doubt that the Fed would have brought them down substantially. Um, and that would have worked through all the normal channels that expansionary monetary policy uh, works. Uh, and w the, um, whether the sharpness of the downturn would have been mitigated a lot, I don't know. That's a hard question. Whether the, the next 10 years would have been way, way different, I think yes. Now, I'm just saying what to me seemed, I think is, is kind of clear from casual empiricism or the you know, evidence we have about the effects of policy and what monetary policy makers do. I don't think it's the last word on the issue. So I, 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 think, it's a great, I think it's a great question. Carolyn? Thank you. Uh, excellent remarks and completely on point given what we're facing here in Canada. And I, I guess I wanted to push in a, in a couple, in, in two areas. One is, is your premise at the start that there would be even more of a burden on monetary policy to do all the work uh, in the face of, a, of a, a future downturn? And in fact, you know, I kind of view that as being maybe part of the issue. Uh, the reason that we, and we being not just Canada, but elsewhere, and particularly elsewhere, uh, there was so much difficulty, especially with a balance sheet recession, getting inflation back to target, being the only game in town uh, meant that monetary policy needed to stimulate demand when there were all these headwinds and, in fact, of a structural nature. And so I guess the question I have to you is that, you know, you know clearly monetary policy has to take fiscal, fiscal policy as given, and, and uh, you're saying in the future we couldn't hold out hope that it would be there. But if it were there, so there, were, there are some governments that do have fiscal space, what do you think the role in fiscal policy is in terms of, say, automatic stabilizers or other mechanisms to kind of ex ante in the framework space uh, have better complementary complementarity of fiscal policy and monetary policy so you can sort of achieve an optimal policy mix? Right. Another fantastic question. Um, and so I think um, of the things that I said, that might be the comment that is least applicable to Canada for two reasons. One is Canada has fiscal space, um, or maybe several, but Canada has fiscal space, I think. And one fact that it's not just the Bank of Canada revisiting the framework, but it's the Bank of Canada renewing its agreement with the government actually means there's some scope for saying, you know, what, what's kind of for more, more coordination. So I think in the case of countries that have run up high levels of debt, countries where fiscal stimulus has become a dirty word, that's where my comments apply. I think that's most of the world. If as part of this framework you know, revision to say, well, one thing that would help is if there were uh, discretionary fiscal policy became more automatic, so if there were triggers for actions or something uh, like that, or um, the central, you know, central bank expects that in dire circumstances, you know, it is the, the government in going to this agreement kind of says, yeah, we get the idea that in, in extreme events, fiscal stimulus should be part of the response. That would be, that would be a fantastic thing. I think that would be a wonderful outcome uh, of this process. I don't know enough about Canadian politics and the details of the, poli of the, of the how this process works to, whether, to know whether that's a pipe dream or whether that's realistic. It, it would be a pipe dream for the US. Uh, but for, to the extent that's feasible in Canada, please go for it. That would be great. John Murray. Two things. David, first, I wondered, I may be stepping into the exotic zone here, but how, how you felt about helicopter money, which would be sort of, if your physical cupboard is bare in one sense, uh, could you think about helicopter money 
and the other is a society without cash. And we know some countries are already facing that naturally. Uh, indeed, all of us are to varying degrees in the developed world. And to a sense, then, you'd be leaning on a, an open door. <laughs> How exotic is the idea of either letting it disappear on its own or perhaps assisting in that? Um, OK. Uh, anyway, uh, more great questions. Um, helicopter money, I, I, I deliberately, I did, you know, I thought about putting it on the list somewhere. It, there are a couple of reasons I didn't. One is it completely, it doesn't blur the line. It kind of obliterates the line between monetary and fiscal policy. So what is helicopter money is, one way to think about it is it's uh, an open market operation plus a deficit finance tax cut. And so if that's all it is, then it just shouldn't be the job of the central bank to do it. Uh, the central bank has its responsibilities. The, Fiscal authority has it, so they should each do their, their own their own thing. I haven't seen anything to convince me that that's not the right way to think about helicopter money. So in, unless somebody can persuade me that there's something special about having both of those actions done by the central bank, you know, at the same time, I, I don't quite know what to, to make of it. So it, it's exotic, but in a different way from my other ones. The, I mean, I think your question about is cash going to go away on its own? Is the zero lower bound a real thing? I think that kind of comes back to David, is very related to, to David's question. As long as you give people the legal option of taking, you know, taking their deposits and turning them into currency, then even if we're almost cashless, we could become very cashful very quickly. Um, so you would, even if you're kind of encouraging us towards less and less cash, you would need that, what, my, what I would think, you would need that last step of saying, well, now it's no longer an option. And I think if you go to um, you know, the middle part of the US and say, um, Jay Powell has thought of a way to make the last recession less severe, you are no longer allowed to do anything using cash. Um, that would be a, a recipe for, um, you know, people with pitchforks marching on Washington. That is my, that is armchair political science, but that is, that is my view. Yes, one last question, please. Go ahead. Right there. Yes, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Um, a great question. I'm not sure it's one I want. Um, so you know, I only had 45 minutes, and so I I didn't go there. I think we so right. So an issue. So I've been. This is related also to, this, to um, Timothy Lane's comment about being aggressive. Um, is if you don't have to worry about other things, then being aggressive and getting to your output inflation targets is the way to go. And then the question is, are there other things that come up systematically? And the idea that incredibly aggressive policy at the lower bound might cause reaching for yield and financial instability would be, would be on, on the list of concerns. We all know what the first best is, which is to have great macro prudential and micro prudential regulations. That's the right way to deal with financial stability. Um, and then the central bank can indeed use its policy, its tools aggressively to use the things that those are good for. In the second best world where that's not true, I don't have anything better to say than, yes, if you're worried about financial stability, you should temper your actions out of concern for them. And that would be one reason not to be super aggressive. I don't, that's not a fully satisfying answer. It'd be not, you know, do you want to make that? Do you want to actually have it explicitly in your policy role in some way? Do we know, you know enough about systematically what triggers financial instability? The U.S. has had, you know, had negative real rates for most of the 1970s, and people didn't seem, you know, we didn't have vast asset price bubbles. We had vastly stimulatory monetary policy for most of the 60s. Again, we didn't didn't get bubbles. So it's a complicated. So it's a great question. I don't have a great answer. Okay, I think we should probably stop to sort of keep us rolling along on time. Let me um, let, please join me in thanking David for an excellent presentation and some very insightful responses.
Okay, we'll now take a 30 minute refreshment break and reconvene at 3 p.m. Merci beaucoup. Fantastic, that's great.
so uh, uh, th this is uh, um, a panel discussion which uh, is uh, on the topic of revisiting the merits of the inflation targeting policy framework and its alternatives. So it's it's really uh, very much uh, following on the same themes that uh, David Romer uh, uh, presented in his um, in, in, in his uh, remarks. But uh, of course, uh, we, we find that, um, that I don't think we've exhausted all the uh, all, all the angles to this issue. So certainly, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, to have three very distinguished panelists here. Uh, Marty Eichenbaum from Northwestern University, Adam Posen from the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and Frank Smets from the European Central Bank. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to ask each of them to speak uh, for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have some time for uh, for general uh, question and answer and discussion. Um, maybe uh, before starting the discussion, I'll put in a. Um, uh, a plug, uh, which is also uh, repeating one that Carolyn made in her opening remarks, which is that uh, as of um, uh, today, the Bank of Canada has actually put out another database which can be used to assess how inf uh, flexible inflation targeting works in practice, and that's our staff projections going back 30 years. And so uh, it doesn't necessarily the, uh, answer the question of like, what were they thinking, but at least it, it answers the question of, of well, what advice were they getting at the time? It, it shows uh, uh, what, what interest rate path the, uh, the staff were, uh, uh, were, were providing and also generally the macroeconomic context for that. So that's, that's uh, uh, we, we think, a contribution to uh, uh, which, which we hope that, um, that some of the researchers either in the room or, uh, or uh, uh, or, or listening on the webcast will uh, uh, will will make uh, will make use of. So with that, I'll turn to uh, to our panelists, uh, starting with uh, with Marty. Thank you. I'm going to speak there. Okay. Thanks. Um, once upon a time ago, in the magical kingdom of David Dodge, our star was high, and the ZLB was never binding. Life was good. Uh, Canada's inflation targeting regime delivered on the promise to, to provide a low, stable, and predictable inflation environment. And uh, relatively small deviations in inflation and large, temporary, but persistent changes in the nominal exchange rates gave monetary policymakers uh, the flexibility to deal with transitory shocks to the economy. So with that in mind, I want to really organize my remarks around four key points. First, we no longer live in David Dodge's magical kingdom. Uh, absent a change in the policy regime, uh, the ZLB will be a binding constraint for Canada and, importantly, for its major trading partners far more frequently in the future than it was in the past. Second, if Canada and its trading partners continue with our current regime, uh, we should expect larger swings in Canadian exchange rates. Third, uh, Canada could unilaterally move from future inflation targeting to an alternative regime like price level targeting. But then exchange rates would play a smaller role in the way the Canadian economy adjusted to shocks, and relative changes in Canadian U.S. inflation rates, for example, would play a much larger role in the way this economy responded to shocks. So exchange rates would be less volatile, and inflation would become more volatile. Fourth. I'm really skeptical that even coordinated versions of monetary policy strategies like price level targeting or its close cousin forward guidance can deal effectively with the ZLB problem. So I'm going to try and be more optimistic than David was. I think we have to rethink the conventional wisdom uh, about the role of fiscal policy in fighting recessions. And I'm going to take this Canadian perspective that we could actually pull it off here. To be clear, uh, I continue to believe that when the ZLB isn't binding, fiscal policy isn't a very powerful stabilization tool. Uh, that's what much of the available evidence suggests, at least time series evidence. But I think for many of us believe that fiscal policy can be extremely powerful uh, when conventional monetary policy has, has been uh, rendered neut uh, neutered. So we have to, the challenge for us intellectually and policy-wise, is to devise a practical framework, and I emphasize practical, for using fiscal policy when we need it, and just as importantly, not using it when we don't need it. So I think there are two promising routes, and I'll, I'll go into greater detail. Uh, I'm going to argue in favor of what I call asymmetric automatic stabilizers. That is, stabilizers that kick in and, just as importantly, out 
automatically under clearly articulated, easy to measure and simple to communicate macro aggregates. And I would be very open to automating various types of asymmetric tax cuts that, uh, that various people have returned, including people like Emmanuel Fari here, as unconventional fiscal policy, but the idea is these tax cuts would kick in and out at the same time as these macro aggregates uh, hit those target levels. So my own preference is to make those targets uh, the short-term policy rate. Uh, that poses political problems because now all of a sudden you have to say, now we're handing over fiscal tasks, we as the central bank are deciding that. Uh, so there are alternatives like the unemployment, alternatives that we should explore and look at in models that might be politically more palatable, even if they weren't the first best. And to be clear, this kind of a proposal clearly involves closer links between monetary and fiscal policy makers, and that obviously has dangers for a central bank. But there are also dangers in ignoring the new realities that we face and placing burdens on monetary policymakers that, frankly, I don't think they can bear alone. So some details. For, because of time constraints, I'm going to just take it as a given that you know, our star has fallen and the ZLB is going to be binding more often in the future. And under a lot of plausible scenarios, monetary policymakers just don't have enough room to do what they need to do via conventional monetary policy. So what about unconventionally monetary policy like forward guidance or QE? Um, I suspect the markets will be skeptical and should be about forward guidance. To begin with, uh, we now understand, partly because of research that some of the people in this room have done, just how fragile the theoretical underpinnings of forward guidance are. In simple New Keynesian models, forward guidance works like a nuclear power charm, right? Unfortunately, that power often depends very sensitively on strict versions of rational expectations and complete markets. Work on learning, behavioral economics, K-level thinking, uh, et cetera, uh, make clear that the efficacy of forward guidance is, can be very sensitive to assumptions that no one in their right mind should take literally. What about less esoteric considerations? The fact is that a lot of central banks began to tighten even when inflation was less than 2%. Now, those actions might have been justified by a variety of considerations, but they certainly undercut the credibility that central banks had about future forward guidance. So I, I just take that as a given. And finally, there's the Larry Summers line. You know, suppose we could get the 10-year rate down to about 1.25% using conventional monetary policy before the ZLB was binding. How much of an effect do you really think you'd get by pushing 10-year rates down another 50 basis points or so by QE? That, is that really going to solve the problem? Well, what about price level targeting? Well, it's a clever way around the ZLB, in theory. And I don't have to explain it because David did a magnificent job of talking about the, uh, the basic intuition behind the, uh, the price level targeting. But what you want to understand is forward, you know, you commit to 2%, the central bank is going to generate four inflation higher than 2% after the ZLB episode. Forward-looking agents factor that higher future inflation in their decisions, and then the magic of rational expectations lowers expected real rates today, and wonderful things happen. Once you say it that way, it should be clear that price level targeting is basically a strategy for committing to forward guidance, uh, to forward guidance, and also depends very heavily on rational expectations. So first, there's the basic question of how long it would take people to understand that strategy. Um, my gut sense is it's really hard. After all, how many times have your st students and relatives confused levels and growth rates? <laughs> As I just mentioned, it shares all that sensitivity uh, to the assumption of rational expectations. You just, uh, you know. Third, and you can't, I, this is very important, there are political and time consistency problems. Price level targeting looks great when you want to rig, when you want to go overshoot your target, but then you get an oil shock and you got to somehow bring it back down. Well, let's see how legislators would react to all of that. Okay. If Canada unilaterally, it is really important to notice Canada's decision to move to price level targeting unilaterally, really necessary, if the states didn't do it, if Europe didn't do it, we're committing to larger inflation movements between us and our trading partners. That and bigger exchange rate movements. Sorry, smaller exchange rate movements. Now, if we all stuck to the current inflation targeting regime and the ZLB bound a lot more than our partners, 
you know, we're going to get a lot more demand shocks in terms of exports, right? Um, but if we're rigging our inflation close to theirs or to close to 2%, the only way we can react is by having increasingly wide fluctuations in the exchange rates. And frankly, recent experience with our neighbors to the south should have convinced us that's not always going to go down so well. So we can't count, I think, for political reasons, for theoretical reasons, for practical reasons on monetary policy per se. Well, you know, before the Great Recession, I think lots of people agreed uh, that, you know, monetary policy, that, fis that fiscal policy was not the way to go. But in abnormal times when the ZLB is binding, um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, fiscal policy is quite powerful. I think any objective reading of the evidence, either from the United States or from Europe or other places, will, will, you should be convinced of that. So why not just rely on emergency discretionary spending in a crisis? Well, as David emphasized, you know, political economy considerations make the nature and size of that discretionary policy very uncertain. And even worse, it takes lots of time to implement the programs you've agreed on. And implementation lags often mean that if these things come on too late, the multiplier will actually be smaller than one, not bigger than one. And I had some fancy overhead from the Hutchins Institute, which has showed the tremendous fiscal shortfalls in the United States. But you look at these and you just, I don't think you can count on discretionary fiscal policy. So that brings me to this proposal that I made when I was fortunate enough to be invited by the Canadian delegation to the G7 meetings in Montebello. So first, why would you be interested in automatic stabilizers? Well, they're fast, they're easy to design in non-crisis, they're easier to, widely, to wisely design in non-crisis situations. And because they're embedded in law, households and firms can count on them with a high degree of uncertainty. And that's a big deal, right? We know that in normal times, you know, demand matters. Demand really matters when the ZLB is really binding. If precautionary savings are higher than they have to be because the people that need help can't count on it, they are going to raise, they're going to raise savings exactly when we know it's counterproductive socially. So putting these things into law is a big deal. Um, why asymmetric? Well, the fact is there's lots of programs that aren't so powerful in normal times but are very powerful in abnormal times. A classic example is unemployment benefits. We know there are pluses and minuses with unemployment benefits. The pluses are classic Keynesian fiscal stimulus. The minuses are, you know, you distort labor markets. So it's easy to see why, you know, you could argue for them. We want them on a variety of social grounds and otherwise, but we don't think they're that powerful. But in a paper with Larry Cristiano and Matias Trabant, we argued exactly that in the ZLB, the demand considerations swamp those negative considerations, and you really want those automatic stabilizers to be much larger. Um, so that's just one example, but there are many programs I believe that would, would qualify. To be clear, there's no reason to combine our attention to asymmetric automatic spending stabilizers. Current tax policy already provides for a form of automatic stabilization because of its progressive nature. Well, why not legislate asymmetric automatic tax policy to per pursue what Carrera, Fari, Nicolini, and, and Pedro Tellis refer to as unconventional fiscal policy? The basic idea is to write into law macro triggers for temporary tax cuts and triggers for ending those cuts. Tax schedules would automatically change in extreme circumstances when the ZLB becomes binding and revert to their old levels when a crisis is over. Carrera and their co-authors argue that in principle, time-varying tax rates can exactly reproduce the outcomes that would obtain if monetary policy never faced a ZLB constraint. So this is a very, so that is to say, clever tax policy in principle can completely circumvent the zero-bound problem. And the intuition is pretty easy if you think about what the interest rate does to consumption decisions. You're basing putting, you know, the interest rate puts a profile in it. But if you have taxes of various sorts, you could put similar profiles that literally mimic what that interest rate does. Now, generally, if you go beyond a very simple model, you have to have uh, uh, consumption taxes, but then you need a decreasing path for labor taxes and a temporary investment tax credit you know, uh, for investment or capital income taxes. And that's pretty complicated. It sounds complicated, and it is. And it also relies on features of the textbook model that many people, including me, view with skepticism. 
This inherently involves forward-looking behavior, rational expectations, and people adjusting to it. I suspect, but do not know, I want to emphasize I do not know, that those policies won't be robust to the, same, to the kind of behavioral uh, perturbations that weaken the, power, the, weaken the power of forward guidance policies. But I wouldn't remove the ideas from the table. They're important. They're worth exploring. And the core of the proposal is Feldstein's proposal for Japan, right? Cut the VAT tax, then put it back on two years later, right? I don't know why we can't put that into law. The difference between what I'm proposing here and what Feldstein is in the large is to make it automatic. The time to do it is now, not in the middle of a crisis, and especially if we're in discussions with the finance minister, at least start to begin those discussions. So let me conclude. Uh, we no longer live in David Dodge's magical kingdom. Uh, the future is likely to be much more challenging than it was in the past. And I am skeptical about what David called exotic uh, policies, which I'm certainly skeptical about, but even the non-exotic policies. And I think that will put a burden on monetary policymakers that we may not be able to bear. It imposes expectations of what we can do that if we cannot deliver, I don't quite know what the political consequences are. So yes, it's an enormous challenge to begin this discussion with fiscal authorities, but it's also an it will be an enormous challenge if we cannot deliver on what's expected of us. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And Adam, yeah, you don't have to get up unless you prefer to. You split up, I'll split Okay. Up. It's a coordinating mechanism. Yeah, clearly. There's a... yeah. Um, thank you all very much. And particular thanks to Tim, to Larry, to Alexi especially for including me in today's conference. Um, I, I really want to give credit to the Bank of Canada, along with John Simon, the Reserve Bank of Australia, you know, you, you, you are choosing in a time of success and a time of low political attack on your institution to really open yourself up to serious questioning and review. Um, I mean this very sincerely. That is a wonderful thing. Uh, you should be very proud of yourselves for doing that. And along with uh, the announcements that have been recently been made about Reserve Bank of New Zealand, maybe it is time, just like in the end of the 80s, when it was Canada and Australia and New Zealand led the way into inflation targeting, maybe it's Canada, Australia, and New Zealand that will be leading the way, maybe not out of inflation targeting, but to what's next. And, you know, David said earlier about you can't replace a framework without another framework, and uh, Tim Geithner infamously, I would say, not just famously during the crisis, said plan beats no plan. Not entirely convinced of that, actually. If we look at the history of what actually became inflation targeting, and you include in it not just the three countries I mentioned, but the experience of the Bank of England, the experience in Chile and Israel, there was an awful lot of adaptation and improvisation going on. It was ex post, including in part in the book I contributed to with Laubach, Bernanke, and Michigan, ex post it got codified. Ex post academics reified it into inflation forecast targeting and started talking about tattooing lambdas on people's heads and doing studies of very fine measures of communication and so on. But in practice, it actually was either an incremental evolutionary process, evolution was something John Simon spoke about some months ago at the Reserve Bank of Australia, or a practical emergency response as our friends at the Bank of England did in 1992. So let us not hold off by saying, okay, we don't have the obvious next thing yet. And so that being the case, let me go a little more forward, and I actually am looking at a stopwatch here, so that will keep me honest. Um, what's, how bad is it? How much should we be dissatisfied with the current regime despite all the lovely things? So um, I think it is very important to recognize that the zero lower bound story that's got us all very incensed is, I think, a little bit misleading. 
because as Marty and David and many other people have referenced, it, it's essentially an assumption that QE didn't work, or at least QE and other so-called unconventional monetary policy measures are very, very poor substitutes for interest rate cuts. And to me, there's no good evidence that that's really the case. It's more the case that general interest rate cuts would not have been sufficient to fix the problem. And this was seen in what remains the most fatuous statement made during the crisis by a non-German politician, um, that you use the interest rate because monetary policy gets in all the cracks. The whole point of macroprudential policy needs, the whole point of the crisis was that there were breakdowns in the substitutability of assets. There were breakdowns in the substitutability of various financial assets. There were illiquidities. And later on, all the critiques of QE were about pushing on a string. The Keynesian critique of pushing on a string has nothing to do with it being QE doing quantities versus prices. It has to do with if there's an extreme shock to risk aversion and to investment appetite, moving the major instrument interest rate isn't going to matter either. So I think while we, it's very nice for us all to get wound up about the zero lower bound, I think the most important thing to recognize is whether it was interest rates or quantitative easing, we had a kind of crisis that was extremely destructive that monetary policy was not sufficient in any form to respond to. And that's where we have to start. And then it gets you into a really interesting question about goals, and goals here in Bank of Canada, rightly, are set in consultation with and ultimately by the government, with the authority of the government. But there is a point at which you have to start rethinking the goals. And I actually, maybe I'm gonna misrepresent David, but I thought it was very nice that he a few times in his lecture mentioned uh, talking about aggregate demand. He didn't say the goal of the central bank was price stability. He said it was stabilizing aggregate demand, I believe. And, and I honestly believe that as well. It's about welfare. And we have gotten into too narrowly this idea that because we're a central bank and the inflation is what it's nominally is our, nominally, if you excuse the expression, is our goal that that's all we should be concerned with. And this is getting back in the back door when we talk about dual mandate or we talk about financial stability. We gotta rethink about the goal. So, I've already mentioned, I'm just gonna belabor again, the, um, if you remember how we got to inflation targeting and what we determined was success of inflation targeting, it was vastly overdetermined. So we have a situation in which suddenly interest, inflation, average inflation rates are going down all around the world. And they're going down essentially unremittingly for a 40 year period, or at least there's a bond market period bond market, bull market for that period. And maybe it was we all did inflation targeting. Maybe it was we all did central bank independence. Maybe it was the US and the Fed did some version of inflation targeting and that had spillovers on everybody else. Maybe it was a succession of disinflationary shocks coming out of China's emergence into the world economy. Each individual shock was temporary, but you had 20 plus years of expanding Chinese production creating short-term negative shocks. Maybe it was technology increasing transparency and competition in markets through the internet for 25 years. We had all of these simultaneously, and yet we tend to think that inflation is a genie that can be let out of the bottle at any time if we ever switch off of doing inflation targeting and making inflation the sole goal. When I say we, I don't mean everybody in this room, and I don't mean me, I mean we, the central banking and central banking clack of which I'm a part, talk about. And we have all this belief, as was mentioned by Marty in various ways and by others, that, and we had the paper this morning, the discussion this morning, that inflation expectations are the key to the whole thing. But again, I think that's a misrepresentation both of history and evidence. It's a misrepresentation of history that ex post, we said, okay, we're gonna look at five year, five year forwards when doing inflation targeting. Ex post, everyone focused on, it, on expectations in these very specified ways. Ex post, we got Bernanke and Woodford's paper. But more importantly, if you look at the evidence, and I think David made a side reference to this, 
you know, I've also, in the same paper about Japan that you had the Brookings papers publish, I was the discussant, thanks to you, and I made some points of similar point, that if you look at Japan, the central bank did every possible thing that if you would ask me, or more importantly, Ben Bernanke or Paul Krugman or someone like that, what would you do to reflate the Japanese economy? They did it all, including arguably compromising central bank independence, coordinating on fiscal policy, having a major exchange rate devaluation, the foolproof way to the inflation target. No inflation. Expectations at a minimum are awfully sticky. And the direct evidence we have for the accuracy and adaptability, and as Marty made out, of the forward-looking aspect for, infl for ex inflation expectations is quite dubious, and yet it still animates so much of the models and so much of the discussion. All right, so enough being negative. Let me try to flip it around. What should we be considering if all that is true? If we live in a world in which it is not we're in two states of the world, the high inflation, low inflation state, if you're not Argentina, it's very unlikely that you will immediately flip back into the high inflation state. If we live in a world in which there are many factors, you can call them real, you can call them nominal, you can call them temporary, but there are many factors outside the central bank's control that are keeping inflation down at a global level. If we live in a world in which the central bank has to worry about overall nominal GDP stabilization, and the real problem with the zero lower bound is it's indicative of a situation, call it secular stagnation, call it a panic. It matters which, but for purposes of this argument, it's just indicative of a situation in which investment-oriented policies are not going to have much traction. What should you be doing? And so, to me, I viscerally dislike the conditional asymmetric, we're going to do price stability targeting when we get near the zero lower bound stuff that Ben Bernanke and Charlie Evans and others have promoted, because it runs up fundamentally against a time and consistency rule. So we spent, starting when I was in grad school, before I was in grad school in the mid 80s, we've spent years assuming there was an inflation bias problem and there was a time and consistency problem with, with monetary policy. For inflation, what we've actually seen is the opposite, that no central bank has successfully managed to commit that they will keep inflation up when it's time to get out. We're seeing this right now with the Federal Reserve that should be overshooting its past target undershoots, that kept claiming it was going to do lower for longer. Nobody believed it, and it turned out they were right not to believe it because obviously the Fed is going to continue raising rates before inflation accumulates at all. Now again, you can say that's the right move, but that really gives the lie to the idea that there's any credibility to these commitments of these conditional ex post, you're gonna make it back up. All right, so what should we do? It's not a one coherent, nice, neat little thing like an inflation target, and frankly, that's reality. One of the problems, the reason inflation targeting has been so popular is because it makes life so much easier for central banks. So Mervyn King, as governor of the Bank of England, used to talk about the fact that the real reason he hated QE was it meant you had more than one dimension to discuss in the Monetary Policy Committee. You had to discuss not just where you thought the inflation forecast was, you also had to discuss what instrument you were going to use. I'm sorry, we do not drive our policy regimes by what makes it convenient and easy and accountable for the people in the policy regime to make decisions. So, I have a seven-part program. <laughs> One. You have three minutes. Yep. <laughs> I know. 12 minutes, 17 seconds. Um, one, higher inflation target. If you're in the world where the expectations are very sticky and there's no reason to think that you're automatically going to slide back into an upward spiral of inflation, might as well buy the insurance and might as well increase the credibility that you're going to get things up. Higher inflation target, not 2.5, not 3, call it 4, opposite my colleague Olivier Blanchard. B, if you're a small open economy like Canada, you can ride it down by actually doing that before other people. Let the exchange rate move 
let yourself ride it down, just as, remember, many economies, including Canada, when they took on inflation targeting, it was partly to ride down the inflation rate as it went and then lock it in. Then you can push part three for some international coordination to lock it in and have people come together around a new level of inflation instead of two. Point four, for those of you who don't yet have a dual mandate, have a dual mandate. This goes to the point, as we were discussing in the coffee break, that if you do the kind of thing that David and Christina were talking about, what you're really doing is just putting a higher weight on output stabilization in the weighted average with inflation, as you are in other things. Point five, start looking at, and I haven't figured this out fully yet, but start looking at wage growth and labor share. I mean, there's political reasons for doing this, but economically, one way of looking at the great sweep of the last 70 years in monetary history is large-scale wage growth is both necessary and sufficient for ongoing inflation. You can maybe come up with a couple hyperinflation episodes based solely on social breakdown and fiscal dominance, but it's very hard in normal circumstances to get ongoing inflation without wage growth. You got to start thinking about that, which includes pushing up wage growth. Six, going back to my rant about getting in all the cracks. This is something some of you have heard me say before. Central banks have to be prepared to get their hands messy, meaning they have to be prepared to intervene in specific markets on specific sets of assets that are not necessarily the most liquid, easily traded asset. If you're not doing that, you're giving up your traction and you're minimizing your effect. And if we look back at monetary history, it is only an artifact of the last few decades that a small number of central banks have basically gotten out of the quantitative and specific intervention business and decided they could do everything by their instrument interest rate. This is a temporary accident of history. It's nice politically. It's nice for convenience. It's not terribly effective when the bleep hits the fan. Finally, going back to Farhi et al.'s, um, what was the word, weird fiscal policy, unconventional? Yeah, I hate the word unconventional. Creative fiscal policy. Um, I had my own version of creative fiscal policy I offered when I was at Bank of England and a couple times since. I have no traction there either, so let me try it again. Real estate booms and busts are 70% of the evil in financial stability. It's not quite like wage inflation and inflation, but it's really hard if you look at the historical evidence to see much in the way of financial damage if you don't have a real estate boom and bust. Some form of countercyclical real estate taxation, which can be identified and set out and defined by the central bank and monitored, but can be implemented at a very local level. Remember, we have transactions, you land, you have title transactions. We know every single transaction of real estate in a country. You can do something about it. And that would be the way I'd link to fiscal policy that would actually serve two goals at once. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Adam. So I'll turn to Frank. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks, Alexei, for uh, the invitation. It always feels a little bit like uh, coming back uh, and visiting old friends, coming to the Bank of Canada. Um, I should say that uh, I will take sort of the pr perspective from uh, the experience that we've had at the European Central Bank. Uh, at the same time, there is a, a red expression there. The views expressed are my own and should not be attributed uh, to, to the ECB. Um, so, um, these are sort of five lessons. I, I, I re recently, together with a colleague, uh, Philip Hartman, did a review of 20 years of ECB monetary policy, uh, which was mostly backward looking, basically descriptive. And so coming here on the plane, I thought, okay, what are sort of five lessons that I could present here based on that, on that review, uh, partly based on that review? Uh, the first one uh, I came up with was keep medium-term inflation expectations anchored. Um, 
The second one is unconventional tools do work in a zero interest rate environment. So I'm a little bit uh, less pessimistic about the effectiveness of unconventional measures, uh, even when interest rates, a short-term interest rate is at zero. But clearly there's not one recipe. Uh, the design of your unconventional measures very much depends on, and I think Adam already mentioned that, it depends on the state and uh, the structure of your financial system. It will also depend a lot on the credibility of uh, the central bank. So expectations will matter a lot. Third, alignment with fiscal policy is very important. And I think that's definitely an area where I, I think there seems to be some consensus. And fourth, uh, macroprudential policy must be alert to offset financial stability risk. Because if you want to really commit to using unconventional measures, I mean, you have to do the whatever it takes. And that means that some of these side effects will have to be attended to if there are side effects. Uh, and that means monitoring, but it also means other policy makers having to step in. And I would say, I mean, if we manage to sort of follow those type of lessons, then I'm not so sure that we need to change a lot in our flexible inflation targeting uh, frameworks. But that's OK. That's maybe pushing it a bit too far. OK, so, so let me just quickly go through uh, each of those uh, sort of observations more than lessons, I would say. Keep medium-term inflation expectations anchored. I mean, why? Um, they are a powerful anchor that puts a drag on self-fulfilling deflation dynamics. Uh, I mean, Adam said it, expectations are sticky. Uh, but once they start moving, that's the implication, then it's actually difficult to bring them back. And so it's very important that we uh, sort of, uh, as central bankers, that we sort of anchor those expectations uh, strongly. Again, that will be uh, an anchor that drags against self-fulfilling deflation dynamics, and for that matter, also against self-fulfilling inflation dynamics. And secondly, of course, when medium-term inflation expectations are anchored, then you actually maintain the monetary policy space that you need for real interest rate reductions. For sure, it will be less if the equilibrium rate, real rate is, uh, is, is, is lower. But uh, if anything, you want to keep that, keep that space. Now, of course, that's easy to say. How do you do it? Well, first of all, looking I'm here at the Bank of Canada, having an impeccable track record definitely uh, helps. Um, but I don't think uh, an impeccable track record comes uh, falling out of the sky. Um, I think it does come from the fact that you have a very consistent policy framework and flexible inflation targeting is such a framework because it gives a clear focal point for the inflation objective. And there's quite a lot of evidence that giving that focal point actually does contribute to anchoring inflation expectations and reducing inflation uh, volatility. Uh, that. Now, then we can discuss whether we can strengthen that uh, sort of uh, framework. Uh, there was a question about the target range. Should we have a clear lower bound? I mean, that's one of the issues, I think, in our case, that we don't have that lower bound. And personally, I think it would be useful to have that. Uh, there's also the issue, uh, I've been a fan for a long time of sort of average inflation uh, targeting because it does sort of gives you some of the benefits of price level targeting that we talked about without actually having to change your uh, communication about what is it that you're trying to achieve, which is average or inflation over the medium term close to uh, 2%. Now, what about the new environment? Well, in the new environment, and I think this is something to work on, I would say also for, for, for all central bankers, including the Bank of Canada, you want to have, and, and I think this was already mentioned, you want to have a credible exante commitment to use unconventional tools to achieve the objective. Now, one of the things I will, and, and I think David uh, made the same point. Now, one of the things I will say later on is, these tools are much more complex. They involve lots of secondary questions about the design. And so it makes sense to think in advance uh, which, which sort of design, about these design features. And it will very much depend on 
the circumstances on how you want to design them. But communicating now already about what sort of the high level plan is in case you come in such a situation, I think is very useful because it will give this ex ante stabilizing uh, impact. And then finally, and I think this was also already mentioned, it very much uh, echoes what, what David says, if you see that actually you get this anchoring, um, don't wait. An aggressive, whatever it takes response is necessary when you see signs of this anchoring. And, and I think Tim uh, asked the question, well, well, what about gradualism? I think also the literature actually suggests that in those cases you want to go aggressive and Ulf is, is, is here. I think you have this research, if, if it's really about uncertainty about inflation persistence, which is really what you get if you get this anchoring of inflation, you want to be aggressive. So the, the old Brainerd result doesn't hold in that case. Secondly, the Adam and Billy results of optimal monetary policy, discretionary monetary policy under zero lower bound actually holds, or if, if you are close to the lower bound, again, you want to do everything you can to stay away from that. Now, uh, so what, what does the ECB experience have to do with this? Well, we kind of faced some of the problems with this anchoring of inflation expectations uh, over the past uh, four or five years. And this is inflation, headline inflation and, and core inflation in the euro area, and I want to focus on the period since 2014, which I call the low inflation recovery in, in our paper. You see the, 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 the dashed blue lines are five-year head inflation expectations from survey of professional forecasters. I mean, it, it dipped a little bit, but it's very much in line with uh, our inflation aim, which is close, but uh, below, but close to, to 2%. Nevertheless, if you look at financial markets and at the distribution of uh, inflation expectations, these are from uh, inflation options, uh, basically, expectations, distribution of expected average inflation over the next five years. I mean, you see that in May 2014, and even more in January 2015, when we started uh, QE, that basically this whole distribution was shifted uh, to the left. And sort of the probability of having actually deflation over the next five years, according to those markets, this is our risk neutral probability, so there's lots of issues there, but was about one third. I mean, that's in spite of the modal being very close to our target, there were clearly important deflation uh, risks. At the time when, and that's the right-hand side, basically our policy rate was at zero. No, the, the deposit rate was basically at zero. We had excess liquidity. The only rate was also at zero. So what to do? If I hear what is being said here, there's nothing much we can do. Um, I don't think, don't think that's our experience. Uh, this is just another way of looking at these uh, balance of risk. This is based on um, the uh, individual answers of, uh, of these uh, professional forecasters about the balance of risk. So you see there was a clear deterioration. And of course, that's also reflected and there's a yellow part in the inflation risk premium, which basically collapsed. Actually doing research on, on this, uh, comparing financial markets and, and, and uh, expectations, I think is very important. Now, what we did is basically we went all out with a sort of comprehensive package of measures. Um, I'm not going to go through this picture. I've shown it before, but basically the blue, this is a timeline, the blue bars or, or boxes are negative interest rates up to minus 40 basis points, uh, and that's where we still are. The green uh, boxes are targeted lending operations where we basically gave lending to banks uh, under certain conditions, based conditions about their uh, credit to uh, non-financial corporates for four years at very, uh, very um, uh, easy uh, conditions. In the last program, potentially even at negative rates, so we're paying banks uh, to, uh, to lend from us. And then the blue part, and uh, the, sorry, the orange part and the light orange part, that's our asset purchase program. And uh, David, you, you said it, it, it's, 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 you do, it doesn't act like a reaction function, but, and I don't have time to go through, but basically we did it like a reaction function. Now, it's true it's more bulky, no? so it's not every sort of policy decision that you change, but of course, as the outlook changes, you do change both the intensity of the stimulus, for example, 
how much you buy per month, uh, the horizon, um, and, um, and, and so on. So that brings me to the second point. I have. Un unconventional policy makes do work in a zero interest rate environment. So we, we had this comprehensive program. How do they work? Very much like conventional monetary policy, by easing financial conditions. Um, now, the precise channels depend very much on the measure, no? Uh, and then again, I'm not different measures have different channels, and there's a lot of lots of research that's being done, and I think that's very important uh, research. Um, I just wanted to show you uh, basically our estimates of what the effects are of this comprehensive easing package uh, after 2014 on financial conditions. Uh, so you have in different financial markets, you have the 10-year bond yield, the 10-year OIS yield, the one-year OIS yield, the NFC bond yield, bank bond yield, lending rates. Basically, although we were at zero interest rates, uh, short-term policy rates, we were managed, the average 10-year yield basically was reduced by 150 basis points. This has big effects or relatively big effects in, in most of our uh, models and, and, and uh, our estimates. And so you can go through each of the markets and basically see uh, the effect. Now, of course, these are our best estimates. Uh, I'm sure many people uh, may uh, sort of disagree with those. There's a lot of uncertainty, but just looking at what happened, uh, whether it's look at the exchange rate or you look at bank lending rates or you look at bond yields, I mean, it's clear there was a significant easing of financial conditions. And so what happened to the large output gap that we had in 2014? Basically, more or less, it has closed. Unemployment was at 12%. It's currently at 8%. We estimate that about one third of that fall is due to the non-conventional uh, measures. What happened to these risks of deflation, the blue, Distribution is basically um, uh, the recent, it's the latest, of, well, it's not the latest, of, it's 11 September 2018. Basically, we managed to bring it back, squeeze it around uh, where we'd like it to be, and uh, currently deflation risks are, are uh, negligible. Um, importantly, wages, we look very much at wages uh, because that is an important transmission channel in bringing back uh, core inflation. And so, of course, as this is a decomposition of wage on the right-hand side, you see how the blue part is the contribution of the output gap or the unemployment gap. And of course, as the unemployment gap closes, basically this pushes up wages. The yellow part is basically indexation. So and the thing that made us very worried is that the, the period of low inflation that we've had, also uh, to a big extent driven by oil prices, uh, was having this second round effect of nominal wages. And because of our policy, also because of our policy, basically the second round effects uh, disappeared and wage growth is actually now uh, almost the same level as it was before the, the financial crisis. Now, the third uh, point, there's not just one recipe. So this is not easy. And, and I think there again, uh, I would agree with, with Adam, the, in, in those environments particularly, uh, life becomes much more complicated uh, for, for central banks. Non-conventional tools are complex. We've used basically all four of them because we really thought we needed a, a sort of a concerted effort to, to get out of these risks of, of deflation. Uh, but all four of them have very important design questions. I mean, negative rates, uh, you have to think about, do you want to have a tier system or not? Again, that will very much depend on what you think is the state of the banking sector, whether you want to sort of subsidize them a bit or not, uh, whether you think actually uh, this, uh, where the reversal rate is, as, as we will see uh, tomorrow. Forward guidance, lots of questions. If you look across central banks, I mean, very different approaches. Uh, date or state dependence, qualitative or quantitative. We've actually used something which combines the two, and we're relatively happy with that. Um, I think it is important to have a state-dependent component, but we also thought, in our case, it was very important to have like a minimum period, basically a commitment, a date, date uh, lag. Asset purchase program, 
again, lots of questions. Private versus public sector security, what maturities? How much do you front load versus back load, open-ended or not? Um, all questions that one can think about, uh, ideally, before uh, you get into. I mean, I think one of the things, of course, that if you review our, our history, is that we did a lot of things learning by doing and adjusting as we learned. Uh, now, for the next uh, crisis, hopefully, we are better prepared, partly because we have more experience, uh, but also because we, we have looked at it. Uh, secondly, there's a need to be attuned to the objective of overcoming the zero bound or addressing impairments in policy transmission. Again, uh, Adam mentioned that. Many of these tools, uh, their objective, and I think it's, it, well, first of, the first point is you have to be clear about what the objective is. I mean, the ultimate objective is always the same, which is pr pr I mean, price stability in the medium term. Um, but uh, how it works and what it tries to address is, is different. And again, you have, to be, you have to be clear about it. If there are no limits to arbitrage and you have a perfectly fluid uh, liquid financial system and perfect credibility of the central bank, I mean, I'm convinced that relatively simple forward guidance can be very powerful. Um, but uh, we're not in this perfect world, and definitely in, in Europe we're not in there. Our financial market was very fragmented. And so in that case, you cannot rely on arbitrage to make sure that your easing uh, of policy gets in all the cracks. Uh, you have to actually start thinking, okay, what are the important uh, impairments? Uh, where do we want to see the credit going? Where do we want to see the financial conditions easing? And again, that's, that's, that's a lot of work. That's, uh, uh, you have to, to, to know uh, what, what is going on in your economy and your financial system. Similarly, if your credibility is uh, not perfect, then again, you may want to think, how can I actually reinforce the credibility of the forward guidance and, and, and research? Uh, I think it was also presented by Michael Lehman uh, last year here, shows that if you combine an asset purchase program, large-scale asset purchase program, with forward guidance, the forward guidance has more, has more power. So the signaling effects uh, are, are, are there. Targeted credit operations, uh, they, okay. <laughs> they're addressed at specific segments. Again, lots of questions. How do you design the conditionality? And then finally, and, and I haven't heard much about that, we have to think much more about complementarities between these various tools. Um, and again, uh, I can talk about negative rates and, and how they have interacted, which I think was a very important tool uh, uh, for us. Uh, one, one, not the single, but as a component. Now, let me very quickly just say uh, two words about the last two. Alignment with fiscal policy is important in a zero interest rate environment. I'm convinced uh, of that. And uh, I think Marty did, uh, Marty did a great uh, job in, in sort of explaining uh, why. I mean, the one thing that I would want to emphasize, of course, it also means that uh, we want to have counter-cyclical fiscal policy in the boom periods to ensure sustainability. And I'm not sure we're in the best place, particularly in your northern neighbor, um, uh, because otherwise you may get sustainability issues unless you think somehow that uh, sort of the central bank can just absorb that debt and keep it on, it, uh, keeps it on, its, uh, uh, on its balance sheet. Obviously, in our case, it's not easy uh, because we are monitoring with 19 fiscal authorities and the debate on the need and design of a fiscal stabilization mechanism is ongoing. And then finally, um, macro and micro prudential polls need to be alert to offset financial stability risks of low for long. I think it helps very much, and I think Canada is an example, to have a very strong financial system with buffers. It helps the credibility of non-conventional measures. But so does the willingness to use macroprudential policy to offset possible financial stability risks. And also there, I think, the, the framework for macroprudential policy, I mean, it's there, it's being developed, but it's still not at the state that uh, I think the successful flexible uh, inflation targeting regimes uh, have reached. Sorry for taking longer. Okay, well, thank you very much. Those were, I, I think, uh, those presentations spanned uh, quite a range of issues. And I, I mean, maybe uh, uh, it's a sense that there's a, a degree of agreement about uh, 
at least a range of the problems. I think there's a sense that, um, I mean, maybe that uh, the, the, uh, there's a bit of a difference in nuance in the sense that uh, I think two of the participants might have seen the glass as half, uh, as half empty and, and the third as, as half full. But I think, and, and, and well, and, and maybe uh, also the, the, the two that saw, I think Marty and Adam obviously have very different, uh, very different views on where, uh, where, where, the, where the room for improvement might lie, and you know, obviously Marty's focus on fiscal policy, Adams, maybe more on the uh, on, on the central bank getting its hands dirty and being prepared to intervene more extensively to address some of the problems in financial markets, and that, in a sense, was a little bit linked to just some of the things that Frank said. So, I guess maybe initially, I'd like to ask any of the panelists if they'd like to comment on on one another's, um, you know, to respond to any of the points raised by others, or should we, or should we just open it up to the floor? Okay, well, I'll take questions then. Larry. Marty, about uh, <clears throat> asymmetric fiscal policy, I mean, to some extent, it's already asymmetric in the sense that, one, if the, when, at the effect of a lower bound, the multipliers are bigger. Two, if there's a bigger shock, it's going to be more asymmetric. So do you think we actually have to build in more asymmetry so that there's a trigger at the effect of lower bound? Um, it just seems like we're you know, raising the ante to the fiscal authorities, which may not be as uh, easy to achieve as one might think. Well, so I don't, <clears throat> first, to be clear, I don't think it's going to be easy. Um, I say, I, I do think we need, there are two channels. One is, and this is hard to know. When things are legislated, people can count on it a lot more than if they say, well, let's see how it works out this time. Uh, so I think that matters a lot as a quantitative thing. The other thing is I think we need more. I mean, I think I didn't put up this overhead of fiscal policy in the U.S., but I think it's pretty clear if you go back in time and ask, was fiscal policy sufficiently expansionary? I think the answer is no. Um, so I would say, yeah, let's build in more asymmetry, as difficult as that might be, as difficult as that might be. But I think now is the time to, I mean, I, I really do think Canada has a unique opportunity because it's got the space, because we're not in a crisis, uh, to do something very special, uh, to really be world leaders in, in this dimension. Yeah, David. I think the issue of first order importance that came up in this discussion is whether monetary policy is still effective, either uh, conventional or unconventional. Uh, and I want to weigh in strongly on the it is effective side. And I have one argument from recent history, one from theory, and one from the grand sweep of history, but I'll try to try to be short. A recent history, I think Adam's characterization was just wrong. Uh, it's not the case that the Fed promised to do something and then pulled the rug out on people. The Fed never, if you look at their forecast, the Fed's forecast was always will limp down towards, you know, with slow recovery and inflation will limp up to 2 percent. It's not like they promised overshoot and didn't. So I think in the Fed's case, it's I think the, the issue is that they didn't. They, they didn't try by their own standards. They didn't try enough. Japan's more complicated, but they did not do anything. They didn't do the full list of Krugman, Renanke, uh, Swenson. They, the foolproof way is a particular thing. It's not just about exchange rate depreciation, and they didn't do that. The theory argument, uh, Ben Bernanke and his young flamethrowing days uh, as a member of the Board of Governors actually made the argument. He said, look, the goal of when you're trying to reflate an economy, what are you trying to do? You're trying to lower the price of something that you, namely the value of your currency, um, you know, the, the, you're trying to raise the price level. It's going to lowering the price of currency. This is an object you can complete, you can uh, create in unlimited quantities at zero cost. It can't be hard to do that. It has to be the case that you can, you can, you can do that if you if you try hard enough. And then the grand sweep of history, uh, this is from uh, a short paper that Christina and I wrote some years ago. What are the two biggest mistakes in Federal Reserve history? They are the Great Depression and the Great Inflation. In both cases, it was monetary policymakers saying monetary policy can't do something. The Depression, not, not, not our fault, not something we can control. Great inflation, inflation comes from other things, and monetary policy can't solve it. So I think one's default view should be monetary policy can work until there's compelling evidence otherwise. Can I respond? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. 
David's wrong on all four counts. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it, it, it really is kind of shocking. Um, the, the idea about the Fed not reneging, it's true that there were various weasel words used by Chair Yellen and a few of the others. But the, and, and so they were very careful never to say the words lower for longer. But the fact remained that there was a lot of news conference, a lot of other things raised about that. You, you're, and you're also conflating two issues. I didn't say, the, the point is, as a matter of political economy, that a Fed that was supposedly committed to a symmetrical inflation target and events at this would take snide attacks at my friends here from the ECB for not having a dual mandate, not having a symmetrical inflation target, were then not fulfilling the inflation, the symmetrical inflation target. So you're actually, in a sense, mischaracterizing my point, which is from a political economy point of view, we are unable to get past the time and consistency problem of agreeing to inflate. On the second point about the foolproof Japan, I, you and I can talk about that offline, but it is really, really difficult, David, for you to make, make a contention that there's anything of any significance that the BOJ didn't do except large-scale currency intervention. And if you want to argue that if once there was a sustained depreciation from 89 to the dollar to 112 to the dollar, and that didn't translate into inflation, that somehow additional currency intervention would have been critical, I think you're going up the wrong tree. The idea of Ben Bernanke and others as flamethrowing theorists talking about the lower price of currency is basically a throwback that contradicts the other more important work Ben Bernanke did later, which was to emphasize the credit channel of monetary policy. And the idea that these monetary aggregates actually matter is something that's been demonstrated repeatedly, including, I think, at times by you. Um, and so you can make this theoretical case, but if you look at any of the central banks that have behaved over the last 20 years, including the Bank of Japan with their vast creation of money, it doesn't seem to have made any difference. So you can stick to the theory all you want, but it doesn't seem to be relevant. Finally, you know, when you talk about the two biggest mistakes being about monetary policy, that's where I would invoke mid-career academic Bernanke. I'm not pretending he's a deep friend of mine or I've talked to him since he's been Fed chair. I'm merely respecting the work. I think the work that he and others did, pointing out that it was destruction of the financial institutions and the informational capital and the banking system that was what made the Great Depression. It wasn't just the collapse of household balance sheets and it wasn't the collapse of monetary aggregates as in Friedman and Schwartz. And that supports the view that I was taking, and again, not to blame Frank Smets, but to support some of the things he was saying, that what really counts when you say, is it monetary policy that matters? Well, no, it's the whole framework of the toolkit that matters. But if you define it as narrowly, the problem was that they didn't do enough monetary policy, then I think you're misleading. I'll just Maybe I'll give David a chance to. you more afterwards, but I don't think we want to go round and round with this, but I don't agree with any of that, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're wrong, so. There's you know. a surprise. Okay, well, maybe, uh, maybe we'll turn to another question from Carolyn. Wow, this is exactly what we wanted. There's there's debate, and it's it's kind of interesting just how passionate it can be about prices. So, um, <laughs> so we are definitely a special crowd here. Um, so I, I guess my question is, um, I actually have two, and they're and they're a bit different. But the first one is is um, Adam uh, talked about a dual mandate, and of course, many of you know that we've been asked to look at that by a number of economists, and um, but. The two others didn't mention it at all. And I'm just wondering, is that because you think flexible inflation targeting is kind of close enough, or there's some flaw in in uh, in the dual mandate that would make you not want to recommend it? Or maybe you just didn't have enough time. So the second question is, for, is really for Frank, and that when you look at um, QE and some of the bigger economies, it's there's a lot of research out there about the, the, the effectiveness of it. Uh, on the other hand, um, one might think that for small open economies who, who are whose prices, the yield curve is quite affected by factors that aren't domestic but in fact global, um, you know, what kind of tool use and design and combination of tools uh, would be maybe uh, different from a bigger economy or a bigger jurisdiction. So would you have any advice for uh, smaller countries, small open economies in terms of what their toolkit should look like, exactly like yours or, or something a little bit different? Would like to uh, respond to that first, uh, Frank. Maybe. I can I can start. Um, I mean, first of all, on on the dual mandate, 
I mean, for me, uh, the flexible part basically covers that. So I, I don't, I mean, there may be a sort of a communication advantage of having a dual mandate, but I, for one, am somebody who don't, doesn't think that it's in, in practice, uh, it, it, it leads to a difference. Uh, and particularly if we talk about the problems uh, in, in the case of a zero lower bound, I mean, these are deficient demand problems. So uh, growth, unemployment, and, 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 and inflation, they go in the same direction. So I, I, and I think the reason why there hasn't been that much discussion is exactly for that reason, because uh, it's not, we're not talking here about the old timing consistency problem where you have a trade-off between uh, output and inflation. Uh, it's a different issue. Uh, and so from that perspective, I, I don't feel it's a first order uh, issue. Although again, I can, I can admit that there may be some communication uh, advantages. The same way there may be communication advantage, but also a risk if you put more emphasis on wages. Mm -hmm. um, on the second issue, and that's again why, why I didn't really mention it. Uh, on the, is it different for open economies? I mean, we're a big, <laughs> uh, op relatively open economy, but not a, a small open economy. Um, I, uh, I mean, e but e also in our case, uh, a lot of the transmission uh, works through the exchange rate. No, I, I mean, I didn't have time to go through the sort of the, the effects of our policies, but uh, basically our best estimates is that it did lead to a depreciation of about 15%. Um, and so I don't have any reason to believe that that would not be the same or even stronger in, uh, in open economies. And we've seen that a lot of the portfolio rebalancing actually went uh, international. Uh, so again, I have no reason to believe that in, in smaller open economies that would not be uh, even stronger. Um, but the mechanisms work also in, 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 uh, in an open economy. Uh, then again, some of the very the more specific tools like targeted uh, lending. I mean, that's very much uh, a domestic uh, policy, directly uh, aimed at your uh, at your banking sector. Um, uh, and and I mean, I understand that actually in Canada, some of these policies have also implemented, but not by the central bank, but by uh, by the the government. And and so of course that that uh, that is also a possibility. Um, so, and, and more generally, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think uh, having a flexible exchange rate regime actually allows you more flexibility to actually implement all those policies. Okay, thanks. Would either of the other panelists like to comment yeah, on these points? Just very briefly, I mean, I, I fundamentally agree with Frank about the dual mandate as a practical matter. Um, you can couch arguments about being worried about unemployment in terms of being worried about deflation or undershooting your target. So I think practically, the benefits of explicitly changing that part of the mandate seem very limited to me and fraught with danger. I, on just a word about this, the open economy, I just want to reiterate because it bridges to another theme. Um, you know, the smaller you are, the less flexibility you have ultimately on real interest rates, right? I mean, I live in a little neighborhood in Glencoe, and there's not much we can do about real interest rates. Um, Canada's not quite Glencoe, but it's not quite the European uh, Union. Uh, on the quantitative easing, and it does relate to this, before we get in, I do believe quantitative easing, we were better off doing it than not doing it, so I don't want my own position to be misinterpreted. There is a question that as you get more micro, as you intervene in more specific markets, you are getting more political. You are opening yourself up to a lot more danger. Um, you know, President Obama, bless his heart, was not able to convincingly explain why he bailed the banks out. Um, now we're talking about some CDO tranche asset thingy that we've got to explain to some farmer in Alberta why we intervened in that market. And that is not without dangers. So there's, you know, in practice, we can get away with it now, but let's see what happens when we get too involved with specific micro markets. Tim, can I make a small oh, point? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, I'm not going to go to dual mandate. I have my say in people, but I'm obviously aware Canada is discussing that, and I'm looking forward to reading more about what the bank is thinking. Just to pick up on Marty's last point, just as, I mean, there is this tendency I worry about that we tend to be too defeatist about politics and we tend to be, 
it, it's like David talking about being too defeatist on monetary policy. I, I think people are too defeatist on politics, and particularly they're too defeatist about politics that could be perceived as, as opening the central bank to attack. Let's remember, the ECB bought an awful lot of private things that people in the U.S. Congress would never have allowed the Fed to buy, and there was almost no political protest. The political protest came because they were seen as potentially bailing out governance. It was the exact mirror image of in the U.S. political context. In Japan, the Japanese government, excuse me, the Bank of Japan has been buying all kinds of stuff for 20 years. Now, you can talk about the distortions that are introduced. That's a different argument, and that's a legitimate argument, and you can get into the empirics of that and the practicalities of that. But the politics did not burn down the Bank of Japan or lead to Japan going as crazy, frankly, as the U.S. has. So I, I think we should be a little careful about the instinctive central banker reflex to assume that if you say something about distribution, you're actually making a political mistake or you intervene specifically. That's a very U.S. specific to this time concern. It is not a universal political law. Okay, other, uh, other questions? Um, yes, Stephen. Yeah, so I guess I got, I got a question about uh, quantitative easing, say. So, so the, uh, so I'm still not getting like a, a convincing story about about uh, about why it should matter. So, so, but I can think of reasons why maybe it wouldn't. So, so the uh, like so the European case. So, uh, if I understood what happened correctly, so so you've got a set of assets that that the the ECB will take as collateral. And uh, the asset purchases consists of buying those assets outright. So the question is, why would, you know, so if it, if it, if the conventional policy is, is lending against the collateral and you purchase, and, and the alternative is purchasing the asset outright, and the first one doesn't work, why doesn't this, why would the second one work? And then in the, you know, I think about like the U.S. case. So, so we got uh, some some asset purchase program where where we're swapping reserves for, say, long 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 treasuries. So, why wouldn't that make things worse? So the the notion is that well, the the, the reserves are are more liquid in some sense. Well, they're not actually because the. You know, here you've got uh, you know reserves that are confined to a particular set of financial institutions versus treasuries, which are widely traded and and used in used in used in repo markets. So maybe you know maybe by swapping the reserves, you know, <laughs> swapping reserves for for long treasuries, I'm I'm making the market less liquid rather than rather than more. Maybe I'm doing harm rather than good. Okay. Anybody like to? Uh... Maybe just on the, on the first uh, question. I mean, these are all very important questions. And actually, one my third point was exactly that we need to think and uh, study much more the interaction between these different uh, 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 sort of kind of policies. But there is a big difference between lending against collateral versus direct asset purchases, at least in our framework, in the sense that lending against is demand driven. No, so so it basically is the the banks that will determine. Now, if they decide to reduce their demand for central bank money because they are deleveraging, because and why are they deleveraging? Because they're hit by asset price falls, which reduces their collateral, which uh, they're hit by their, their, their capital is reduced, and so on and so forth. That's something you don't like. Uh, if you have an asset purchase, you basically push out. Uh, so this is supply. Uh, policy, uh, and of course that has a, an impact. If you believe uh, our our estimates or lots of estimates in the literature, that does have an impact on asset prices. So it increases asset prices, and so actually it may increase the value of collateral and thereby reduce some of the, these deleveraging uh, components. But I think the big difference is in our normal policy, we just provide what. Uh, the financial system wants, no? And that will basically set the interest rate that we, we like to have. But in those cases, actually, this, this is not what we want. We want to have more. Uh, 
and and so then you really have to 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 increase uh, excess liquidity uh, that's only when you get these portfolio rebalance effects and so on and so forth i mean in our well maybe i shouldn't in in our case one of the, uh, and, and i think this is now also quite well known the effects are larger the sort of the less liquid the market is the less impaired the more impaired the market is and of course in our case although we have uh, our uh, public sector purchase program uh, has sort of fixed shares across countries uh, no but still what you see is some of these uh, in, in interest rate differentials across countries are also falling because again there is portfolio rebalancing no so if 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 uh, if basically you take out some of the safe assets or the return on those safe assets go back, some investors start moving to some little bit more risky assets. And so some of these uh, premium uh, get, uh, get, uh, get reduced. Uh, and, and, um, and so that's one of the channels uh, that, that you see in action. Uh, and as, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, uh, Bill, you had a question. Right? Well, I'm not sure anyone on the panel will want to ad address this uh, uh, head on, except maybe to tell me I'm uh, uh, thinking of a, a scenario that's vanishingly unlikely, but we're fighting, refighting one past war here. I want to refight a different past war. I want to suggest that by the time we get to 2021, uh, inflation may have gone a little higher uh interest rates uh including long-term interest rates will have continued to move higher uh governments will be noticing that their debt servicing costs are going up uh and some unfunded liabilities or uh, under recorded liabilities particularly pensions are going to be turning into more cash requirements um and political attacks on central bankers which we're already hearing a few of might be getting more intense and i just wonder if we ought to spend uh, just a moment or two thinking about th the other risk, uh, the traditional one with fiat currencies and heavily indebted governments that we might be seeing upward pressure on inflation rather than worrying so much about the zero lower bound. Okay, uh, anybody like to uh, comment on that? Um, the, the thing is, it's not so much that won't happen or couldn't happen, it may well happen, but we know how to fix that. You raise interest rates. <laughs> You do what Volcker did. You you do what you do what you do what the the if necessary you do the exchange rate stabilizations. So I mean I don't mean to be dismissive of the seriousness of what you say. No, you can yeah what. Well, we talked about raising the inflation target. If I'll just go to the our own federal government's unfunded pension yeah. liability goes up by thirty two billion if you raise inflation by one percentage point by their measures. Um, you know, that's a big transfer of wealth, and I can think of people who would love to see that transfer happen. So you did mention that as a possibility as well. Yeah, and, and obviously it, that's one channel. It depends on the specific structure of the Canadian government's obligations. And there are other aspects of indexation and non-indexation. That, that, that's, a, that's a partial equilibrium estimate based on one person, a part of the Canadian budget. And obviously the greater nominal growth has some effect on the, on the debt stock as well, and presumably has some effect on the exchange rate. So, you know, again, if you want to get into, is this the right strategy from a debt sustainability situation, then we can get into some very specific numbers. If we're talking about whether it's a monetary threat that we're going to be back in the world of, as you put it, fiat money and high inflation, you know, again, we know what to do about that. And it's frankly, if you, it's, it's, if you look at the history of the major economies over the last 50 to 100 years, if anything, the debt carrying capacity of them and the relationship has been much, much higher than people thought, you can leave Japan out of it and you still get that result. And the inflationary effect of large government debt and the ability of large government debt, <laughs> governments to inflate away their debt has been much smaller than people thought. So again, you can worry about all you want, but we know what to do about it. And people seem to be willing to do what they need to do about it. Okay, well, um, I think this brings us to the end of our, uh, our time. And uh, 
Uh, and so I'd like to thank, uh, the, thank the panelists once more. Um, thank you. So um, we, we've, uh, there, there'll be a reception uh, starting at 4.30. And so for those of you who've accepted our invitation to join the reception, it's gonna be in the foyer of the, uh, of the Bank of Canada Museum, which is located just outside the doors of the conference center. And for our, our external guests, that's where you came in, uh, where, where you entered the building this morning. Uh, but we're gonna have, uh, have people here to, to shepherd, uh, shepherd you there. Um, for those of you who have accepted our invitation to dinner following the reception, it'll be, in, it'll be inside the bank on the Noel Terrace, which is the roof of our old uh, center block building, uh, but it, you access from, from, the center, seventh, from the seventh floor. Um, if, you're, um, uh, if, if you're leaving uh, the bank in between now and dinner, uh, there's a different entrance that you'll need to use to come back into the bank, and that is the um, that is the uh, um, uh, East Tower entrance located at 245 Spark Street, and we'll be dis uh, distributing a map to show you where the entrance is located. Uh, when you arrive, you'll be escorted up to the uh, up to up to that level, and um, so. Uh, but and if you again, if for visitors, if you're departing the bank now, please uh, turn in your visitor passes and. Uh, well, yeah, turn, turn in your visitor passes to the security officer located at the conference center uh, exit as you leave the conference center. So, uh, so look, look forward to uh, uh, dinner for those of us who are staying and, uh, and, uh, and a good uh, day tomorrow.